While those being passed out, I would like to acknowledge also uh, school committee member uh, Teddy Tarallo is here. I did not. So to your point, uh, Councilor Lacava, if, if, if I can go through this, I think it answers those questions Perfect. there. And where, where they're not directly answered, there I have the extras at the end, so I'll hopefully <coughs> go through that. Okay, then. thank you. Absolutely. Okay. So thank you all for giving Leanne and I the opportunity to be here. I want to thank the members of the school committee for joining us today. Um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes to walk you through um, really focusing on the fact that what you have in the budget book that was sent over from you is a different number today than it was when that book was printed. Sort of walk you through why and you know what the process was to get us to the new number. Uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say is in line with the mayor's recommendation to the city council. Could you please speak up? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. So I was saying that the new number that you have in front of you is, I'm pleased to say, aligned with uh, the recommendation by the mayor to the city council. So I, I won't go through each of these pages, but on page two, those are our strategic priorities for your reference, and that's what we generally use to sort of guide our work in the district. If you look at page three, though, we have sort of one overarching priority that has come into play over the past couple of years, and that is sort of addressing, and I put it in quotes, the post-pandemic, because I don't really know when we'll exactly be in that post-pandemic era, but the post-pandemic needs of students. So over the past couple of years, uh, we've seen needs uh, increase for students, particularly around social-emotional health and well-being and um, you know students that are receiving special education services in particular as well and we believe a lot of that can be attributed to the trauma that the pandemic has caused for families and students if you look at page four these are some of the budget drivers that brought our initial budget in at a higher percentage than we typically do and if you you look at your book that was handed to you um, that was a 7.33 percent increase at our initial request which is higher than we typically come in at. And some of those drivers uh, had to do with contractual obligations, which we have from year to year. We have seen a large increase in out-of-district tuitions. These are for our special education students that need services that we can't provide within the schools of Waltham. So they go to outside uh, schools where they receive services there. Uh, we do have a commitment to expanding and continuing um, some of our programming, in particular the dual language school which next year is slated to move into the sixth grade and then our career technical education programming at the high school, which as you know, is will expand in the new building. So we're trying to stay ahead of that expansion by uh, adding staff each year as we go forward so that we are prepared for the move across the street. Uh, there was an increase in transportation costs this year. And then uh, ESSER is on that list because last year for FY22, we did use approximately a million dollars of ESSER federal aid that's the COVID relief funding. Um, we used approximately a million dollars of that to help close a budget gap in FY22. So that presented itself as, um, as sort of a, a deficit to start with that we had to, to just contend with. So that's one of our drivers. Page five shows you sort of the, um, the migration of the initial request, which was 100,978,135. Uh, there was a three to three uh, tie vote by the school committee on the 27th of April at a slightly higher number. Um, the school committee uh, voted on a budget that added um, a paraprofessional position at the amount of $30,000, and that's why you see that new number of 101-008-135. Um, at that tie vote, the budget then went to the mayor's office, and then as you know, she made a recommendation to the city council in May for a school department budget of 98,784,463, which is a 5% increase. So the difference was uh, approximately just under $2.2 million. And as of 531, 2022, um, our team, along with the school committee in, a, in, a, in two public workshops and one public meeting, uh, were able to make some adjustments to the original request of 100 million 
uh, to reduce $2.2 million from the budget to come to you today to present a revised operating budget request of $98,763,726. So I'll just walk you quickly through how we, we got there and what is sort of left in the budget in terms of new uh, positions. So on page six, these are adjustments to new positions and expansion positions within the general fund. And the adjustments that we made after the mayor's recommendation was to reduce $782,124 from our original proposal. That eliminates 12.32 FTE from the original proposed budget. That shifts a position, a new position of a certified nursing assistant, CNA, to the ESSER grant for next year. So that takes it off of the general fund. And, and by the way, when we, I should note, when we move these positions over the grants, we move their, their benefits package over with them as well. So that's, that's also off of um, the city side and goes on to the grant. So following these, um, these adjustments, we have the positions that you see listed here that remain as proposed additions to the general fund. <clears throat> and that uh, comes to the total of 4.4 FTE. And there's some abbreviations here, so I'll make sure we all know. The DL is dual language teacher. That's at the Kennedy, so that's the sixth grade. That's where the sixth grade will be housed for dual language, and that's a 1.0 teacher, full-time teacher. We have two additions for uh, career tech ed. That is a collision teacher, which is a 0.6 addition, and a culinary teacher at 0.6. And then we have some small ads here. We're increasing an evaluation team leader position, that's special education dual language, uh, which is, I believe, 0 0.7 or 0 0.8. The evaluation team leader will go up, go up, go up by a 0 0.1, um, closer to full time. Uh, increasing a special education teacher at dual language by 0 0.4, and increasing a school adjustment counselor at dual language by 0 0.2, and increasing a school adjustment counselor at Stanley by 0 0.4, and then an adjustment to the world language uh, program at Kennedy by increasing that by 0 0.6. These are not uh, other than the culinary teachers on the top that are part-time, the other smaller ads are adding to an already existing position. So they're not, we're not hiring a point one teacher, for example, as an ETL at the dual language. We're adding to a part-time position um, that already exists. On page seven, additional adjustments that we made of $1.5 million is the recommendation to shift 16.25 FTE from the general fund to the ESSER grant. Um, and I'll talk about those in a moment, um, but they are primarily around enrollment and some needs for program review. These are positions that we identified um, under those categories I'll talk about in a moment. Um, some additional savings through circuit breaker, uh, a reduction of point, which by the way is, is, a, is, a, is a mechanism the state gives us for reimbursement around special education costs, unexpected special education costs. Um, a reduction of a half-time position of fine and performing arts at the McDevitt School that is driven by student course selection and enrollment. Uh, some additional cost savings due to retirement. So we put a number in the budget book back in November in December. Since then now that number has become real and we know um, that we can, we can project an even higher amount of savings due to retirements. Uh, reduction of two administrative support paraprofessionals, one at McDevitt and one at dual language, <clears throat> and the reduction of a 1.0 special education paraprofessional at Kennedy. These reductions that are here do not re represent uh, a loss of uh, employment for any of our current employees. There are other positions that were vacant that they would move into, uh, or they were uh, taking advantage of retirements or resignations. So um, there were no um, layoffs in the scenario that you see here. On page eight, I talk, uh, I provide you a little more uh, detail around the 16.25 FTE that we are recommending we shift to the ESSER grant. Uh, six and a quarter FTE were identified as potential reductions for FY24, not the current upcoming budget, but a year from now, uh, due to enrollment. So we have some small class sizes at the elementary school that we really want to take time in the fall the school committee and the, and the school administration to look at carefully um, to see if in fact those low numbers hold and then if they do we would recommend that these uh, five sections plus the related music drama art PE 
uh, would be reduced in the FY24 budget. If we were to do that based on the numbers right now, it would bring class sizes up to about 21 in those sections. But again, there's some unpredictability around enrollment still with the pandemic sort of waning. Uh, we have seen uh, enrollments sort of hold steady. They dropped, of course, during the first uh, full year of the pandemic, but they've sort of held steady. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Excuse me, <clears throat> Superintendent, please. Excuse me for a minute. Mr. Chair, I have a point of parliamentary inquiry. Um, could I ask the superintendent if he would define what ESSER is so that I have a, a relative understanding of what he's talking about in terms of what he's suggesting, acronym. please? Is it spelled out? I was just saying, uh, <laughs> President McMinnman, I don't know the acronym off the top of my head. Let me. Nice. Your page was before. Thank you. That's fine. I, 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 I'd like him to say what it is, please. Yes. Okay. I don't have to read it off the page here. Thank you. It's the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. Elementary and Secondary School, school Emergency Relief. E emergency Relief. Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's become so familiar to us as the acronym that I don't spell it out. So that, um, that, that's what we recommend looking at in the fall for those reductions there. Uh, similarly, uh, related to enrollment is the potential of reducing a half cluster at McDevitt at grade seven and a half cluster at McDevitt at grade eight. Uh, you may recall the budget uh, a couple of years ago added a third cluster in all three grades at McDevitt School. The enrollment <coughs> seems to be trailing off there now and we may be in a position, again, want to analyze that in the fall to reduce uh, the seventh and eighth grade to two and a half clusters each. So that would be uh, the reduction of four uh, positions at McDevitt potentially for FY24. Uh, we moved three positions over that are associated with the challenge program right now, which is uh, an enrichment program at the elementary level, um, only so that we could take time to study that program and make sure that it is um, delivered with efficacy and that it's an efficient model um, in terms of the number of FTE. Uh, and in a similar vein, the lab program, which is a um, uh, intervention uh, program for ELA, English Language Arts, at the middle school. Um, to, we move three of those positions over to ESSER to take the time to look in the fall about whether or not that is an effective use of FTE. So these positions have been, at least on my radar, since coming in as superintendent, uh, this is now my second year, and we want to take the time in the fall to have a serious conversation as a school committee and school leadership as to whether or not um, we should be considering um, taking um, these steps to reduce those positions due to uh, enrollment. I did provide you with enrollment uh, information on page 9 and 10. We engage with uh, NESDEC, the New England School, <laughs> it's another acronym I won't know for you off the top of my head. Um, th they are an agency that uh, provides us with uh, enrollment information. Um, and so their five-year projection for Waltham um, for pre-K, I'm sorry, for K to five shows a slight decrease over five years uh, and the same for six to eight. Uh, you know, almost uh, two and 2.62 percent at the elementary and just over two percent for the middle school. Um, when they gave us this report in the spring, NESDEC did note that with a caveat that the pandemic relief, they're still not sure exactly what's going to happen, particularly in communities that have students that enroll in large numbers that are new to the country and what uh, will happen perhaps at the border and how that could change uh, enrollments in, in communities that tend to uh, enroll a lot of uh, students and families that come from outside the U.S. Um, on the next page 10, you can see that the high school enrollment uh, is sort of trending slightly in the other direction, um, according to NESDEC, with just slightly over 1% uh, increase over five years. So statistically, I see those enrollments as steady, uh, but we want to watch those very carefully, particularly in the fall. Uh, we tend to get a lot of new enrollments right in August, September, and then we get another um, influx of enrollment that happens usually <coughs> mid-school year, in around January or February. So we'll watch those closely as we develop FY24. On page 11 of the handout is sort of the add back. So when we did the cut of the 2.2, a reduction of the $2.2 million from the original request, there were some positions that we pulled out that we need to add back some, some smaller stipends that were removed 
because of uh, potential new positions. So for example, the math coach stipend, um, it's, it's a relatively small amount, um, but that stipend was removed because we were asking for a STEM coordinator or STEM director at the elementary level. We pulled the STEM director off of the request and therefore we need to um, go back to compensating sort of a lead coach uh, to help um, support teachers uh, with math instruction at the elementary level. Um, we similarly asked for a guidance director at the high school and that person would have assumed the duties of building the master schedule at the high school and coordinating testing at the high school which are currently being paid for by stipends. By pulling that position off of the request, we are requesting to add those stipends back in so that we have somebody to do that work. Um, and then since the initial budget to now, we learned of additional, OOD stands for out of district, additional vocational out of district tuitions that were not known uh, at the time of the original budget proposal. So these four bullets together equal an add back of just over $80,000. So on page 12, there's another um, sort of summary that shows you that we started at the number of 100 million, 978135. Um, the next line is what is referenced on page six. Uh, the changes to proposed operating budget is what is referenced on page seven. And the add backs and additions of 80,000 is what's referenced on page 11. And that brings us to the 98763. And it's, I realize it says 725 in here. It should say 726, which is the number on the page. So I'm sorry I'm, I'm off by a dollar there. Uh, and that is a difference. It is $20,000 uh, less than the mayor's recommendation um, to the city council. And just in, in closing, to make sure that I answered the questions that the city council asked us to address the last couple pages, um, one of those questions is, um, are there currently vacant positions being um, that are being requested for FY23. So with our organization, which as you know is very large, approximately 1,000 employees, it is typical that we will have vacant positions at the end of any fiscal year or at any point in the fiscal year. Um, this year was, was a little different, however. We had more vacant positions than I think we've carried in the past. Um, like a lot of uh, organizations and businesses, we're struggling to find people to fill certain positions. So we spent much more time this year, for example, with open paraprofessional positions. We just advertised over and over again, recruitment efforts got us no candidates. Um, those are positions, however, that are tied to special education programming, and we are carrying those forward in FY23 with the hope of being successful in filling those uh, with the new fiscal year. Um, on page 14, I talk briefly about any increases or decreases that we would consider as significant. Um, on the increase side, I think you'll note that um, there is a out-of-district tuition increase of $1.2 million. That's a significant uh, increase there. Um, and I would say that there is, a re there is a relationship to that with the pandemic. We have children coming back to school after many months of being remote or hybrid or um, disconnected in some way, and that we are finding that they are exhibiting needs and um, you know, some students that are in our special education program, their needs have been exasperated over time and that they're needing to go to an out-of-district uh, placement. So there is an increase that is significant there. At approximately $83,000 increasing in our transportation budget. Um, in our special education contracted services, these are one-to-one -one nurses or having to contract with outside agencies to do um, special education evaluations, psychology, uh, psych evals. Um, academic um, avowals and so forth. Um, that is a higher number, particularly the one-to-one -one nurse. This is something that we're seeing students coming in with this need more than we have seen before. Um, as you know, we do have programs in district for students with significant disabilities um, and health is included in that. And many of these students have the need to have a health professional with them. And so that is a significant increase there of $462,000. Um, and the decrease side, we do have a decrease of 116,000. Uh, we have switched over to a new student information management system. Last, this current school year, we were actually carrying our old system and our new system for a transition year. So next year, we are done with the old system and that saves us that amount of money. We go back down to using just one system. Um, and then on, lastly, on page 15 is the number that we expect to return to the general fund. 
We don't have an exact number right now, but Ms. Wilsinski projects that it will be uh, less than 1% of the overall uh, FY22 allocation. And with that, I'd be happy to. Great. Thank you very much for that detailed report. On committee, Council Fossey. Through you, Mr. Chair, good, good afternoon, Dr. Regan and uh, Ms. Wisinski. How are you? So I, I really don't know where to begin with this. Um, you came in originally with the request of a hundred million nine hundred and seventy eight thousand one hundred and thirty five dollar budget. Um, it came out of the school committee tied three to three. That's correct. Can you tell me who the votes were? Yes and no. Um, I believe. Uh, the yeses were uh, Ms. Gately, Ms. Donnelly, and Ms. Coleman. And the noes were Mr. Tarallo, Mr. Frasca, and Ms. Aljamal. So on Wednesday nights, I have some weird ritual of watching you on TV. When that number was presented to the school committee, how many workshops did you have with the school committee? When the number was initially when presented, the number was initially presented we had to the not school committee. Had a workshop with the school committee. You had none. And you oh, I'm sorry. We had one initial workshop. I believe. I believe, yep. and, I, and I may be wrong. I can go back to the video, but it, you didn't have any. Was what I saw. And when I look at this book, which is your operating budget, and I go to page six, it says the budget process. The school department annual operating budget is developed through a collaborative process led by the school committee. The superintendent and the assistant superintendent of finance and operations with guidance and support from all school administrators, directors, and principals. When I flip further in the book, And I just lost the page, forgive me. On page 30, the budget process for all funds through a collaborative process led by the school committee, the superintendent, and assistant superintendent for finance and operations with guidance and support from all school administrators, directors, and principals. It's stated twice. And I believe there was one more time that it was stated, but yet the budget gets submitted to the school committee with nothing. I had the great fortunes of reading about 400 emails, basically telling the school committee and the mayor to bring back the money that they really didn't have any control over until there was a request at the school committee to have a workshop, and your answer was you weren't aware of that, that it was an oversight on your part, and please forgive me. But now these members are being held accountable for a budget that they had very, very little say on. You then had a workshop, and the mayor, and the number came out of your workshop with that group, and I believe it came back out still at 100 million 978. Nothing got changed, so it was kind of, to me, that kind of looked like, you know what, I'll appease your request, I'll have a workshop, and thanks for coming, and here's my number. The mayor then took it and did what she had to do and gave you an increase of 5%. What was the increase of the city's revenue last year? I don't, I don't know that answer. It's in your book. I believe it was 6% we grew. And it was in the letter that we got that the city grew at about 6%. So a 5% increase to a 6% growth on the city is pretty fair because I know in my household if my revenue grows by 6% and I choose to spend 8% I won't be in my house very long. Um, there's an interesting page here. 2023 budget drivers. The schools are for kids. But your first bullet point is contractual obligations. Money. Where are the kids? Then it's out of district tuitions. Kids that are leaving. Correct? 
kids, for kids special, are, for special education students that are leaving, yes. That we can't provide for our own kids, they're leaving our city. So that's the second driver of your budget, people that are leaving our city. Then there's expansion and continuation of existing programs. It's a third bullet. The fourth one is transportation as a budget driver. The high school has 39 half days on Wednesdays for, what do we call that, teacher development? Call it, yep, common planning time for teachers. That transportation budget is costing my city or our city $120 more per bus for 25 buses for 39 weeks to the tune of $117,000 to send the kids home early. But yet, that's one of the drivers of the budget. So deductive reasoning says, keep my kids in school. They're going to learn. I'm going to reduce my transportation budget, and I'm going to have more money for them. But we don't do that. It just seems like we're not putting the kids first in this budget. You go into adjustments. Adjustments to new positions and expansion positions, and you're eliminating 12.32 full-time from the proposed budget for a tune of $782,124. We go to the next page, and you're eliminating 1.5 million. To get to the 2.2, it's a shift of 16.25 full time from the general fund to ESSER. ESSER is basically a COVID fund. So we're pushing, we're pushing the problem down the road to next year. That's so we're going to hope that we get the COVID money, because everybody, when there's a problem in life now, everybody just relies on COVID. In the real world, COVID isn't going to be here forever, hopefully. And we're not, but we're pushing it down. But of the $2.2 million, you've taken it all out of the classrooms. What are we doing on the administrative side? Well, I mean, we, we, there, are, there were positions that we eliminated of the 12.32 that were proposed administrative positions. So we're not reducing any uh, positions that are currently what are we what are we re for the classroom those those classroom positions were shifted over to the grant they're, that's correct but they're not. shifted over because of grant money but are we doing anything administratively to reduce our budget so yes so there was a there were two director positions that were in the proposal that were removed the those, director, were, those were director budgets that you were looking to add correct yes but we're we're moving we're moving teachers around that we need um, <laughs> because there's a, there's a line in your book here. <sighs> but it's, it, it goes along the lines of that we're looking to retain and develop basically the best teachers possible. But yet your budget is moving people around and shifting them around as opposed to finding money to keep them doing what they're supposed to be doing in the positions that they're at. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of confused on, on, on how your budget is, is, is working. Um, but I'll get off of that. I mean, I just wanted to clear the air with the people watching at home because I know it's a lot of people are watching. And I don't think the six people that are sitting in that corner have as much to do with this budget as the emails are leading them to believe. Um, so just to clear their names. Um, you're showing a downward trend in the enrollment, but we continue to have increases in spending. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Well, that, that piece there to one of your earlier comments, that's why the positions that we're shifting over to ESSER were deliberately identified this year. Last year when we used ESSER funds, we did it sort of in a blanket um, amount to sort of close a gap. We're trying, we are kicking the can down the road, you were right about that by using ESSER again next year, but the hope is that we're doing it with a little bit more of a deliberate look so that we know that those positions, to your point about enrollment reducing, that we are in a position where we should be seriously considering reducing some classroom positions. I know that's not a popular thing to say, but when you have class sizes that are averaging at 14 at the elementary level, you have room for reductions there in, 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 in cost savings. Um, the other piece that I think is important for people to know is 
even as enrollment trends downward, the complexity of the students that are in front of us is increasing. And so we're, you know, we're, we're having to spend more, if you will, uh, to support the students in front of us perhaps than we have in past years. So to your point about out of district, it's not, we have very good in-house programs for students diagnosed with autism. We have very good in-house programs for students that have significant medical needs. But those only can go so far. If you have students, for example, on the autism spectrum that have uh, violent behaviors and we can't keep them safe or the adults around them safe, then those students need to go to another placement. So it's, it's not that our programming in-house isn't designed well to support those students, it's just that the complexity of needs is pretty significant. Um, a lot of students coming in that are coming in at the age of three into the preschool that need a one-to-one -one because it may be a child that can't sit up on their own, um, can't feed themselves, they have a serious medical condition and they need either a one-to-one -one nurse or an aide. And so those complexities I think were not being seen at the rate that they are now um, in the past. So 1.2 million out of how many out of district? How many kids is that? I don't know that number. So we're saying it's about 120 out of district students. 120 kids out of district, which is a low, which is relatively a low number for a district of this size. We do. A, I, I will say we do a good job at keeping a lot of students in district because of our programming. So okay. So I go back. I found the line. It's on page 17. It says, "Retain, cultivate, and recruit high-quality teachers and leaders to stay in the system," which, quite honestly, I think is the backbone of the school. Mm -hmm. The system. You don't have good teachers. You know. You know the kids are going to suffer. On the next page, you say, <clears throat> "You know, we want to retain, cultivate, and recruit high-quality teachers and leaders to stay in the system." But then you say, "We want to increase the racial, ethnic, linguistic, and cultural diversity of educators throughout the system." What does one have to do with the other? I want the best of the best. I don't care who they are. So that, that line just kind of just stuck out at me. It's, I want the best teacher for the program in, the, in this system. Um, you know, I, 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 I see a lot of what goes on. I hear a lot about what goes on. Um, I think you're willing to sit there and tell me that we admit that we do have problems in our system. Um, one of the big questions that I have and I get from a lot of people is, are you able, you personally, are you able to stand there and retain your attention for 80 minutes? I believe I could, yes, but that's me. That's Now, can you retain your attention there for 80 minutes with three minute breaks and do it four times a day for 180 days a year? I have not tried that, so it's hard for me to answer that question. I'd, I'd challenge you to do it because the answer to that, quite simply, is no. We, 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 we openly admit that our kids have attention deficit issues. They can't focus. But yet at the high school, we, we're implementing a four-block period, <clears throat> 80 minutes long. Is that proving successful for the, for the students? And I'll even go the other way, for the teachers. Can the teachers keep a class focused and entertained and educated for 80 straight minutes? Well, I mean, theoretically, yes, that schedule has been proven successful in schools around the country. I will say that that is not our final schedule. That schedule was supposed to be a pilot for this year. Mm -hmm. We were unable to come to an agreement where we could get a, a different schedule in for next year. And so due to time constraints, we extended that into the following school year. When, the, when, did you, when did you as the superintendent of Waltham Public Schools realize that that schedule was not the ideal schedule? So I would say, so last year we were mostly um, at home or, or, or uh, hybrid. So it was really hard to assess the effectiveness of that over the fact that kids were learning from a computer, right? So it was hard to separate those two out? Yeah. So, you know, as the year went on this year, I mean, we were probably about midway through when we had some options put in front of us by, there was a committee of teachers and admin together at the high school that were looking at the schedule. They presented us with multiple options. Um, 
the data that they gave us, which was surveying students and, and, and faculty, showed that there was a general a consensus that the longer blocks, I'm not saying 80 minutes, but a longer block was preferred. Um, when we got to the table to talk about um, different options, it quickly became evident that we weren't going to be able to get one of the options that was looked at without uh, impact bargaining, which we weren't in a position time-wise to do um, for this coming year. So we made some modifications to the schedule for next year um, with the timeline of getting um, a new schedule in front of us before we get to the, uh, you know, very far beyond the calendar year of, uh, you know, of January. So that we know what we need to do to adjust and build that schedule because it starts in February, March of starting to build the schedule so the timeline gets very tight. So when you say impact bargaining, what do you mean? So we would have had to sit with the union and, and negotiate changes to working conditions related to the schedule. So it goes back to budget driver number one, contractual obligations and not the students? It does, but unfortunately... To not come up with the schedule what I hear in my life is pre-COVID. What was the high school schedule pre-COVID? It worked, didn't it? I can't answer that. I wasn't here at that time, so I don't. I, I hear mixed things from people about that schedule, but I, I wouldn't. It was. Feel it was this. It was the schedule at Waltham High School for the most part since the creation of Waltham High School in 1970. So my non-educated opinion is it worked. But you're telling me that you and your staff and all the people that you collaborate with for the budget couldn't sit down and say, well, what did we do three years ago that may have worked? But yet we're going to have yet another class of students just go through a system that doesn't work and they fall off the edge and they say, well, good luck. We'll figure it out with the next group, hopefully. But who knows, you might not have enough time between now and next year. You know, I, I, I sit here and I, I know the schedule stinks. There's many people in your building that know the schedule stinks and they can tell me over a beer. But you worked with guidance and support from school administrators. So they're either lying to you or you're not listening. But yet we keep doing it. Other problems uh, that are we an open campus? Is that a question? Welcome High School an open campus? It is not. It is not. But yet, prior to the shooting in Texas that was a tragic event, we didn't have anything. Our answer to Evaldi was we, we now have two, two teachers driving around in golf carts, basically corralling students as they, as they leave the building. That's our security measure, and only because there was a shooting. Prior to that, it was come and go. <clears throat> you know, and they're going to hate me for saying it, but I, I know my kids go to the school. I see it. Why are you home? Well, I don't have a teacher. Well, what's your plan when you don't have a teacher at the high school? Well, Dad, I get to go to the lunchroom, or I get to go to the cafeteria and sit there for 80 minutes. What do you do? Nothing. And then we have Hawk Blocks, which is another, another study group. All it is is recess at a high school level for 80 minutes. And we're teaching these kids towards a 180-day school calendar because that's what the state requires us. But is it 180 days of attendance? Or is it 180 days of physical work in the classroom? Mm -hmm. I think you know the answer to that one. But it seems like the kids are out of school more than they're in the school. You know, I don't know if the general public hears it, but I mean, I, I, I hear of the fights that go on, the sexual assaults that go on, the violence, the, the vandalism. I mean, story is, I think in the McDevitt, somebody threw a floor washer down the stairs, $12,000 machine down the stairs. There's certain hallways within the high school that are unoccupied classes. Do you know what goes on in those dark rooms? 
I bet you do. But do the people on camera know? I doubt it. You know, and, and it's graphic and it's sad. These kids are in high school, but they're left to just run amok with sexual misconduct, swearing, vaping, drugs, and they just come and go. But we, we, we've got a budget of $100 million based on contractual obligations, out of district tuition, but not the kids in mind. You know, the email also goes on and says, you know, school committee and mayor, please put our children first. Like, we haven't done that. We gave you a check for $374 million. We're building you a state-of-the-art school. On top of the 374, I believe we spent roughly $35 million where a majority of the people in this horseshoe put their necks out on the line to acquire land that was a heavily disputed conversation throughout the city that divided people. So right there, we've over $400 million. We then further went and spent $4.5 million on one Balm Ave and immediately transferred it to the care, custody, and control of the high school for an agricultural program. Well, from the looks of it, are you going to be able to get any teachers that are going to teach agriculture? We'll see. I then approved $8.1 million to the school budget to renovate Larry Field. So we've given you $430, $440 million without batting an eyelash and said, here, it's for the good of the kids. But then I get attacked because we're not doing enough. But then I see the products that are coming out of the school and I'm saying, what are we doing? $400 million, you know that old expression, you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. And I'm, I'm just afraid, I'm just afraid of you know, what the kids are missing out on. And, 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 I, and I don't blame the teachers, I really don't. I mean, they're there, they're working hard. I don't think they're getting the support but I do have a question about that. In their contract, the teachers have contractually, I believe it's 50 minutes of prep time daily? Uh, the contract, I don't think it gives the amount of time, but it talks about a period of day. So yes, it's a period of day, rough, which roughly, which ironically, it, uh, the number comes to me at 50. And that comes from people within your school administration, which leads me to believe that the old schedule was 50 minute classes. So we do have a formula of what the classes are. But when they have an off block, and they have 50 minutes of prep time, what are they doing with the additional 30 minutes that contractually, they're supposed to be doing other things. Are they monitoring halls? Are they monitoring bathrooms? Are they substituting for other classes? The answer is yes to those. They uh, are? Yes. They, sh yes, they should or they are? They, they are. There is a duty schedule up there. What I can't answer for you is how efficiently that is used. That is something that the principal and I have spoken to each other about um, that I don't believe the year started with them utilizing staff uh, on in a duty schedule the way they should have um, and that was a problem at the beginning of the year that sort of set this in motion um, I think there is more time contractually that they can be assigned to well talking I, I don't talk to the principal but I do talk to other people within the schools um, it's still a problem it's not happening um, like I said the, the kids are just kind of doing whatever they please in this budget with all the numbers what's in it for substitute teachers i don't know what the line is it's roughly two hundred thousand dollars two hundred thousand dollars per year for substitute teachers so if i were to take and the book and the book tells me that the average teacher salary is 84,659 so that's going to get me 2.1 substitutes is that $200,000 how much does a substitute get paid about $100 a day so would you do that job for $100 a day no i would not no <laughs> that's why we have a hard time finding substitutes so so if we're trying to get a substitute for $100 a day and we can't and our solution is to send the kids to the lunchroom or the cafeteria wouldn't we reevaluate the budget and say what do we need to do to get a substitute that's going to actually teach the kids 
Yeah, I mean, the, the pay is one thing, but I mean, we're not out of the ordinary in terms of our sub pay. In, you know, compared but we to are out of the ordinary. It's, we're having a f hard time finding people to do it for a number of reasons. One is the pandemic. A lot of our subs were uh, older retired folks that when the pandemic started, we're not comfortable coming into the building for obvious reasons um, with the with the virus. We have not brought many of them back in. They're still not comfortable coming back in. Um, so yes, sub coverage is an issue. Um, when a teacher gets COVID now, it's not like a cold and they're out for a day, they're out for five days. So that just exasperates the amount of time that we have coverage issues. And that's at all schools. I know your focus now is on the high school, but that's, that's at all schools. They're struggling with that. Um, and we're look. We're we're hoping that as this continues to wane, that this we get to a better place. That the the CDC changes its guidelines, like they can continuously do, and perhaps it isn't a five-day mandated absence when you have COVID. Um, that you can come back if you're symptom-free after two days or something to that effect, so we can get teachers back into the building. Do you have a list? An attendance list of the teachers and the amount of time that they've taken off throughout the year? Yes, we track that. Then I'd like to make a request to the chair to get the attendance list of all the teachers for the last year. Um, basically to see are there repeat offenders? Who's coming? Who's not coming? I mean, one of the stories on the street was that during the pandemic, you, could you had to log in to the system, correct? That when we were remote, Mm -hmm. We were logging in. You had a way of tracking who was logging in as teachers to conduct their classes? Uh, y yes. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose Yeah, we were using Google Meet. So we. So the story around the, the fire pit was that there was at least one teacher that people know of within the system that didn't log in once, but yet got paid. Not yeah. once, which means that they didn't teach the class for one single day, but yet they're part of the budget. And we can't get teachers, and we can't get substitutes, and the kids are going home. I don't, I don't, I don't know how true that is. I, that is not something that. I mean, this this is the pulse of people that are in the trenches, not the people that are way up high, um, you know, getting nice salaries to to manage. Because I believe one of your lines was that the city doesn't understand the school budget that we need to be top-heavy administrative in order to watch the people doing the work. I'll go back to the school committee yeah, meetings. They're recorded. It's, yeah. it's, I mean, I may, have, I may be paraphrasing, paraphrasing, I may be I paraphrasing incorrectly language, slightly, no. but it's, it was along those lines that you need to be top-heavy administratively in order to be able to manage the work. In the private sector, I need more people working and less people managing. Well, we, and we have that. And I don't mean we need to be top heavy, but I do think we need school leaders in place to make sure that the work is uh, is led and facilitated, and that teachers are supported. So. I don't think the teachers necessarily need to be led. I need. I, I need. I think they need to be given the resources to do their job. Um, but I'll stop for now. I'll, I'll let it go to other people and. Uh, do you want to make that request? I definitely Council? want. To, I want to make the request to see what the attendance record is for the teachers in the school system um, for the last request. year. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Should you get that in writing, Councilor. I will. <coughs> Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Vidal. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, Dr. Regan. Thank you for being here this afternoon. I, I'm going to. Just like the council to my left, I do have several questions and I'm, I'm gonna be covering several areas. So I'm gonna start with one. The, on page 84 of your booklet, you refer to, you use the NESTIC again, the New England School Development Council. This is, yes. this is the organization that gives you some trends, um, tells you how things are gonna be in the school in the upcoming years and so on. And you use them quite often it is mentioned on previous booklets that you have given us. I've been in, as a member of the uh, Finance Committee for many years, and I've seen that, and I already know the acronym and what it stands for. So I'm familiar with that. Now, how reliable is information on the trends that is given by this organization? Have you seen year after year? I don't know, perhaps you or other members that, are, are these numbers somewhat telling you what the future is going to be, or are they kind of just let you pick from what, what they have and you just pick whatever you think it's kind of 
the right thing to put in in this booklet? No, I feel pretty confident in their numbers. They um, they, they use a, a, a bunch of statistical models and they look at the birth rates and the survivability of each cohort. and. But they, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, reports they've given us over the past two years have always come with an asterisk that indicates that the pandemic is making this a little harder for them as an organization. Um, one thing that they do do is they provide us a fall and then they provide us a spring update to sort of monitor and see where they are. Okay. Uh, but they are, I believe they're a, a very accurate uh, representation. On your comments, again, going to the enrollment trends paragraph, you, are these, is this, paragraph that starts with the impact and it ends with students is this a paragraph that because there are a lot of information there that I'm wondering where it came from such as you know uh, over the past school year there has been fluctuations in the real estate market which has impacted student attendance patterns and I want to know where that where that statement came from and what what data do you have to say that yes there has been real estate market fluctuations, therefore the attendance in our school has dropped from what I'm seeing on the following paragraph. Yeah, that information comes from the NASDAQ report. Okay. All right. Now, when, when it, in the sentence before that it says, as such, it is still too early to identify many of the factors that could impact school enrollments. When would it be the right time to find out what those factors are? Would the NASDAQ be the one providing you with that information is something that you locally know what those factors might be and the reason why the enrollments are dropping. So we, we would rely on NESDEC as a heavily to, to help us uh, track the enrollment trends, right? So, so those factors included, right? There, so they're, they're sort of also monitoring um, population growth and, um, you know, not just in Waltham but across the state and the region. Um, and using that data to help inform individual communities um, with their projections. Okay. I don't know when they'll get to a point, though, where they'll feel like things are back to, quote, unquote, normal, and they feel more confident mm -hmm. like they used to pre-pandemic. Okay. Um. Now, uh, the same comments that you brought in from NASDAQ from the 2022 budget, and, and I, I have all these books lined up in my house, and I review them before I come here. And perhaps you don't have it in front of me. If you do, great. If you don't, that's fine. But you gave us a breakdown of how many students went to private schools and how many were being homeschooled. Yet I don't see that sort of data here unless it's somewhere else. So that was in. In page 109 of the. FY 2020, 2022 budget, um, it talks about this year, 60 students transferred to private schools and 40 students enter homeschool and we anticipate their return after the pandemic ends. I imagine that was not NASDAQ, it was you guys, because right. uh, unless NASDAQ knows the, the data. No, that was us. Okay. And I don't know if that was in F FY 21 or if I, what Leanne and I are thinking is that that was added in 22 because yeah, 2022, that, was, exactly. that was a year where we saw a pretty significant shift of students due to the pandemic going to private and homeschooling okay. options. Now, have, have, based on that, have, have, have you seen this so mentioned um, anticipating the return after the pandemic ends? Are we still under the pandemic kind of yeah, umbrella? Some have come back, but we've not, they have not all returned, no. Okay. So, and I think that is why you're seeing the trends changing direction from where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, pre-pandemic we were talking about enrollments going up slightly and that's, that direction has changed. So all of those students have not returned. Will you happen to have the data that you can share with us about us, how many students of these students, the 40 students that enter homeschooling, um, how many of those have come back? Do you happen to know any sort of data or Oh, if that number has increased, any, any sort of yeah, So we, we can tell you how many students okay. we currently have that are, yes, okay. in private I, and homeschool. We have that. Could I make that request, Mr. Chair? Can you just clarify that request? Sure. The request is to get a, an updated number of students that were, that entered the homeschool scenario to go back to regular public schools. You've all heard a sense of that request. On that request, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Yeah, let's have it, and could that please come in writing, Council of Edom? Yes, you got it. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right, so next year, God willing, I'll still be here. All of us will be here, healthy, 
Um, I'm going to be looking at what the NESTEC has to say about the enrollments again, because it, it's an interesting pattern if you go year after year and how much it fluctuates. And it makes you think twice about the data that they're providing you. I think sometimes I understand your forecasting is never, it's not meant to, it's not meant to be accurate because you're forecasting the future. Same thing about whether man gets the amount of inches of snow we're going to get. I think you're also, but there has to be some sort of a guide or a percentage that tells you there's a point in which you say this is enough. These numbers are not really that accurate. And I've been seeing a pattern like that. And like I said, to the point in which I, I know what NESTEC stands for, and there are a lot of acronyms in your book. So it's something that I'm going to keep an eye on. Hopefully, God willing, I'll be here next year, be able to uh, go over those numbers uh, with the school department. Now, to another part that it was also brought up last year, and we bring it up again, it was the the excitement that I had and, and, and the happiness that I had in which the school department was creating a the Waltham Opportunity Institute. And I was very happy that that took place, but it failed. It, it, it was a failure. It didn't even last the whole year. And my question to you is, why did the Waltham Opportunity Institute fail? How, why did it fail our students? I think we tried to create this program, Council Vidal, with, um, um, without having a budget impact. And as a result, we didn't have the components we needed in place for it to be successful. And I regret to say that, but I believe that's the case. When you look at other districts that do programs like this, they have dedicated administrators that are leading it with teachers under them and it's almost like a school separate or a school within a school and we did not have the funding for that structure and we tried to do it by shifting some funding that we had in other places over and it turned out to not be enough so the teachers for example who were getting paid at their contractual hourly rate um, it, 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 this was a very difficult year for them and I think they felt as the fall was going on that this was becoming unsustainable for them and I understand uh, we're seeing that across the board with teachers who are you know struggling to sort of do the extra <clears throat> and to be even if they're compensated it's it's they're 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 really struggling after two very difficult years so those different components of WOI like on the surface I believe they were there but it was we, it was an attempt to do this without having a significant impact on the on the budget for FY22 and when we look back at it I think that was you know it was a it was a good attempt and and I, I appreciate the people that put the idea together but that we didn't have the resources that we needed to make it as successful as we wanted it to be and, and that's a serious concern to me because this goes into what I bring up every year when I'm reviewing the budget for the school I was to spend money we spend a lot of money, millions of dollars, to support our kids. And I bring this up, and nobody brings it up but me. Our dropout rate. And I'm going to go over those numbers for everyone who's watching, because this is very important. These are the Waltham students, the dropout rate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start 27, 2018, I'm going to start. State average, 1.9%. Waltham, 4.5%. 2019, state average, 1.8%. Waltham, 3.5%. 2020, state 1.6, Waltham 3.8%. 2021, state 1.5, Waltham 4.1%. That's an upward measure. And you know where I want to see that? I want to see that on page number four of your facts and figures. Because the same time that we're talking about how the average teacher salary is $84,659, and the per pupil expenditure average, all funds, is $21,571. We should also mention what our dropout rate is. We will realize that we're failing some of our students. And that's not fair for our community. It is not fair for our students. It's not fair for our families, because no one really mentions this. It's like somebody just puts it aside. And it's funny, because in the previous book from the FY 2022, it states, it talks about the dropout rate. Yet for some reason, in the new book, I looked, I went through it, could not find it. Nothing dropout rate, nothing to do with anything about 
English learners regarding the dropout rate and the relationship between the two of them, and that's a concern to me. Because we're all together in this, all of us. We're all the same. We're all the same people. We're in this beautiful community. And we should care about for the person who's going to Harvard the same way we care about the person who's trying to make it. And that hits home. That's all I got for you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Vidal. <coughs> Next, off committee. Me? I'm, I'm going off committee. Oh, sure. I thought you meant I'm off committee. No. Oh, you like that? Huh? No, she's next. Council Blake. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for coming in, Dr. Regan, and thank you to Madam President for indulging me. Um, I'm going to piggyback slightly on uh, the other councilors and then go in a slightly different direction. Um, how many high school students do we currently have? Roughly, uh, roughly 1,700. I don't. It's, it's just under that, I believe. 1,700. Um, and do you happen to know our college-bound senior rate at this point in time? I, I don't have that in front of me. I'm sorry. Um, I, I have a figure that's pretty close, uh, around 50 percent, um, and it goes up and down uh, year to year. Um, and so, one of the questions I have is. In the upcoming budgets, so right now, one of the line items that the Council from Ward 1 went over is we send some of the students out of district. Um, and when we open up the new high school uh, with the CTE programs, is there going to be a reduction in the amount of out of district students we send? So are you referring to students that are out of district at other uh, uh, career technical ed programs? Anything or? that we can do in-house at the new high school that we won't have to sort of outsource. Okay. So it, it is likely that because we're adding CTE programming that we may see a reduction in that particular um, type of out of district tuition, mm -hmm. like students going to Minuteman Tech, for example, or another school like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, we, the new school does not have additional sort of special education programming mm -hmm. um, like our task program or our connections program. Those will still be there, but we don't have new programming that's coming in yeah. that uh, necessarily will address As those far as students. the CTE programs, if there is a program at Minuteman Tech that Waltham does not offer and not one of our partnering schools, we then have to outsource it and pay and send a student to Minuteman Tech for that program, correct? Correct. They do need to, now that we have an exploratory, they mm -hmm. do need to go through the exploratory program here with us. But yes. as we add HVAC, for example, which is coming online in the new building, mm -hmm. a student that wants that program doesn't need to go out to another technical school. They mm -hmm. can stay in Waltham. Yeah. And do you know uh, CTE programs have a higher operating cost? Um, do you know what that number is offhand approximately, percentage-wise? I don't. Uh, I think... I think it's about 15 percent higher uh, average um, and you can find it three different what you know you can find different percentages if you look around far enough but um, and the reason I'm pointing that out is if we have an approximately 50 percent college bound senior rate um, potentially we could have what would your approximation be for CTE students 50 percent um, in the new I mean, high school, how many how many students do you think will take the CTE program? So it's oh, cosmetology I or uh, that. I mean, that's hard to project. I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I don't think it would be as high as fifty percent. I mean, I think it would certainly be great if we had at least that much participating in some mm -hmm. level of the program. That's the idea. There's going to be more integration. Um, I think the question is hard to answer because I don't know if we're talking about students that are fully in the program mm -hmm. to sort of go through or kids that are. Uh, taking it as a part of you know their overall high school experience, but they're not looking to end up with a certificate or mm -hmm. um, other credential at the approximately end. thirty percent. That would that would that could be. I, I don't have that that information. I'm sorry. All right. Um, it, I covered that. Um, so, and the reason I wanted to point that out is. As we're talking budgets in future, and one of the reasons I want to ask what the cost savings we could look into the budget for what would be 
done in-house if we have 1,700 students in the high school and 30% of them going to CTE um, that has a 15% higher cost of operation, the CTE programs, um, we're going to see an increase in our operating budget in the new high school. I think that's fair to say that we will see an increase in cost because with the additional CT programming, we will need staff for those programs. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, there is a higher cost to maintaining those programs. So I would assume that there be accounts for those programs would, would increase as well um, mm -hmm. or would come to fruition. So again, if it's a new program, yeah. uh, we currently don't have any funding for that, so we're preparing for that. They have... Um stock costs, whether, you know, HVAC has material costs, cosmetology, whether it's the cooking materials for culinary. Um, so they, they definitely have a higher operating cost in addition to trying to entice teachers from out of the trade, which also has an additional cost. Um, and, and the reason I'm, I'm going through this is I spent 20 years on the advisory committee at Minuteman Tech. Uh, and I also went down and was on the advisory committee when they opened up Somerville High. Um, so I as far as the voc ed, I've been at it a little while. Um, I don't know if you know, does that look familiar? It does, yes. Uh, that's I can't my, read it, but I assume it's okay. your license. That's, yeah. that's my secondary vocational education, Mass State certification for teaching. Um, it's not current, I let it lapse, but, um, and the reason I'm pointing this out is I, I'm, worried about as we come through if we have budget shortfalls as the council president had pointed out and i know we saw a transfer from the general funds we got a communication uh for an approval we had a shortcoming of our i think it was our hotel rooms uh some of the tax money we had a couple million dollar shortfall and we transferred from one fund to another um and i don't know if you've had any contact with somerville high um, to see they're a similar CTE, you know, smaller community, but they've had some struggles. Mm -hmm. And currently right now their HVAC program is not open, is not operational because they don't have a teacher. Right. Um, and, and as I look at the percentages, um, Waltham High, as the at-large counselor had pointed out, has uh, $21,000 per pupil in Waltham approximate numbers um, and I'm going to read to you what's below that so uh, as far as per pupil dollars amount below that um, Blackstone Valley Regional Technical High School uh, Montauchet Regional Vocational High School I think I butchered that name but Tri-County um, Bristol County Agricultural uh, it's a charter school Greater Lowell Voc Tech Whittier Voc Tech Minuteman Voc Tech all spend less dollars per pupil in vocational technical education or CTE programs currently than Waltham High does. So I think when, I, I guess I would be pointing this out and encourage that we have some more uh, budget workshops uh, for a little future um, to sort of look at what we think the budget will be. You know, a lot of people look and then purchase a larger home, and then what goes along with the larger home is, you know, higher taxes, higher heating bill, higher electric bill. So I, I think we should be looking at that. I think we should also be contacting um, Somerville High to see what their struggles were in getting teachers because starting to do it as the programs are opening up, um, as they found out was too late uh, and, and hopefully another thing is with the CTE programs hopefully it reduces our dropout rate because some of the kids will find a passion in Vogue Tech Ed so thank you very much and thank you Madam President for the, for the time and Mr. Thank Chair you Council Blank person. back on committee Madam President so thank you very much um, Jim Lacava. So, Dr. Regan and Ms. Wilsinski, this is your second budget? It is my second budget, yes. And 
I've been here longer than Ms. Wilsinski, so this is my budget, her budget, and everybody else's budget, and more. <clears throat> so the first thing I'd like to clear, get, have cleared um, for a lot of us is the angst that seems to be pervading the city about the schools and the school budget. Last Friday, one member of your school committee filed a late file communication for the agenda for this evening's meeting. Do you have a meeting this evening? Yes, yes we do. Um, could you tell us what that late file communication is requesting or asking? Uh, yes. Um, uh, Mr. Trollo made a request that um, we add to the agenda, which had, had been posted already, um, that the school committee consider voting to uh, reinstate or add back the $2.2 million that was recently reduced from the budget. Budget request, I should say. So request. do you know the process? Uh, so that's a request that the one member of the school committee has the right to make in a late file communication to an official meeting of the school committee. I consulted with the chair, and that's the process she asked me to follow to, 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 to add it to the agenda as a late so file So it's on your agenda for tonight. As a, it's, it's, as a late file communication, correct. But it's on your agenda. It is, yeah. yes. So let me do a hypothesis, a little bit of hypothetical here. I can go, like when I used to teach reading in the fourth grade, I can choose my own adventure in all that series of books. I can get to a certain uh, roadway, and if I go left, I go one way. If I go right, I go another way. And at the end of each of those roadways are more doors that I can choose my own adventure again. And I could read that same book 30 times and end up with a different ending each time I read the book. And it's fun. So let me use that analogy in tonight's meeting. We are, after two days of budget review, reviewing a budget before us that has created angst throughout the city in the school population in the parent population, and in every other population I could name, with all those alphabet names. And yet, what we're doing here, for my opinion anyway, is an exercise in futility. Although, the two councils to my right and my left have done a wonderful job so far. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to trump them, and there's no pun intended in that. So if we get to whatever we're doing here right now, and whatever end we get to, I'm not even sure what's going to happen here. And then tonight, the school committee has a regularly scheduled meeting at which they have a late file communication that will be reviewed and I'm assuming the request to restore that money um, will be acted upon. So let's choose the adventure that, let's say the school committee votes this evening to restore the $2.1 million that the mayor cut in this budget two weeks ago. What happens then? To be honest, Madam President, I'm not sure what the next step would be. Why, I would, why don't I would, you know that? I would look to the chair to, to give me direction on that. But this why wouldn't is, you know that? You're the superintendent. I, I am. I'm just p p speaking to what the next step would be, whether that means that the school committee, that the mayor then has to come back and, and, and request so on behalf the of the school. So you don't know the process? I do. Well, I, this is unique to me. I don't, this part of the process is me not, too, but uh, so it, I don't know This is that, the first no. in 40 years I've ever gone through anything like this, just as unique to me. You're a freshman, I'm a veteran. We're both looking at this a very, very same, first time ever. I know the process. It's an embarrassment for me. I got yelled at by the mayor last week when she 
called me to tell me that yes, the city council can add back <coughs> to the school department budget. Why? Because I voted for that back in 1987. <coughs> I had to go back and find out what that meant. And I know exactly what it means. It's very complicated, but it could very well happen. And so tonight, if, so what happened in 1987 is this. Let me back up a little bit, because I've been here a long time, but I've been in education just as long. So in 1981, there was a Proposition 2 and a half that went on the ballot in the state, and it was passed by the voters to keep the property tax values in every city and town across the Commonwealth from absolutely going bankrupt. And it's done that every year since 1981. But then in 1993, there was a joint venture by the, the Massachusetts General Court, the State House, to enact a 278-page educational reform bill. I will get to that in my questioning. I'm not there yet. I will get to that. In 1987, the general court saw fit to allow local option for any community to adopt a section that would allow, not under Proposition 2 and a half, but that would allow the, the community's legislative branch, us, to add money back to a budget that had been cut, no more than that, but add money back into a budget that had been cut or reduced by the chief executive. So now what happens tonight? If the school committee votes, whatever it is, maybe they'll go three and three again, I doubt it. But I think it, it very well might pass that, and this is a blame game now. That's what it's coming out to be is a blame game. Do you blame the mayor? Do you blame the school committee? Do you blame the city council? Teachers, send me 675 that go into my spin, uh, 675 emails. Blame anybody. Because there's not enough money. Well, that's life. There's not enough money for anything. That's why we have budgets. So tonight they vote to restore the money that the mayor cut. So then that vote comes back to the city council. And then we need to make a decision whether that money should be restored in the original budget as it was proposed or not. But there are problems with that, and I'm going to have our auditor explain exactly what would happen if, in fact, we voted to restore that money. And it needs two-thirds or a supermajority of the members of this body in order for that to happen. Mr. Auditor, could you explain exactly what would happen if we were to do that, please? Well, I think there are two scenarios. One is that if the city council wanted to keep the mayor's recommended budget at the 312 plus million dollars and put and would have put and restore the, the 2.2 million dollars, it would mean cutting an equal amount off the city side. If the city council wanted to restore the 2.2 and go above the $312 million budget, it would be increasing the tax levy from, from a $10 million increase to a $12.2 million increase. So we could restore it and then, like we did 20 years ago, we had a problem like this, but we, as you reminded me, we cut $300,000 out of the medical Three city million. side. I'm sorry, three million out of the medical, out of the medical side of the city. We had to do that in order to balance the budget because we don't have the, the, the luxury of your side. You are an independent department. You oversee, as chief executive, you oversee an independent department that we on this city council have not one bit of control over. And nobody understands that. Nobody. So what I would say to you, based on what, what uh, the auditor just said, is this. 
If you look at our big budget, which of course you don't ever get, but you are the chief executive of the largest department in the city, and I think it's coming upon you to do that. So if you look at our pie chart, which is here, but that really doesn't say the whole picture. As you can see, the largest part of the pie is orange and yellow. The yellow is the school department. But it's not all of the school department's money or budget. Because the school department's budget's also included in here and here. So the school department's budget is $99 million on this pie chart for just the budget. It does not include the indirect costs, which I will give you in a second. And the police were in to us today earlier. And I said to the chief of police, do you realize that between your department chief and the fire department chief, blue and red, your budget is only $42 million, but the school department's here is $99 million. Think about that. Think about that for two minutes. Now, your budget, I go to the next page. I don't think you've probably ever seen this page. But I'm going to make sure next year, if I'm here, that it goes to the school department, because I think the school committee needs to think about this as well. So, in our budget, this is a very simple, it's the simplest page we could have. City of Waltham, city versus school comparison, FY 2023. General fund budget. City side, $174 million. School side. 98 million seven. But let's go to the school costs included in the city's budget, in the city's budget, not yours. We go to the next line. Indirect costs to your employees. Health insurance, <coughs> pensions for your retirees, on, on, et cetera. What page are you on? There is no page number. Okay. All right. They can find it. It's, it's, it's in the, if you look, in the um, executive summary, it's in, it's in the first 15 pages, very simple. So what you see here is taken from the city side for indirect cost of, pe of pension and um, health insurance um, and for your, for your active and retirees, taken from the, the, our side is 35 million three and put over in the city side, uh, the school side. The debt costs, which is principal interest payments for the school capital projects. And I will remind you, we have three more years and we will have paid incredible, incredible, we will have paid for eight brand new schools, unheard of in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Why? Because we are all pretty fiscally prudent. That's why we actually have Eight new schools built, all paid for, unheard of. So on that side, the debt cost for those things is 11 million one transferred over to the school side, 11 million one. So you get down to the bottom, the bottom line is this. In the general fund budget for next year, proposed 127 million eight for the city, 145 million two for the schools. So we are running the city side of the budget with 48% of the money. And 52% of the money goes to the schools. Now I will start with my questions. With that backdrop. <clears throat> Sir.
So, Superintendent Regan, would you please tell us what process, you, you spelled it out here, but I'd like to hear it from your own words. What process did you use? This is your second year on the job. What process did you use to create your budget? Uh, we started uh, in late October, early November by engaging with, uh, well, we did have an initial meeting with the school committee to set budget parameters. Um, when I mentioned a budget workshop earlier, that's the one I was referencing. It was not sort of a workshop in the sense I think that you were talking about, Councilor Fossey. So we, we met with them to discuss sort of the parameters around the budget, and um, then we went back and worked with the leadership team um, gave them those parameters, had them go back to their departments and create individual department budget presentations that then they brought forward to the central office leadership team. Uh, we sat in a room with them over a couple of days. They each made a presentation to us. That was in December, where they shared with us their additions, uh, potential additions. Part of the parameters that we gave them was to, if you are asking for something new, Think about what it could be traded off for. What could you give up? What don't you need? Where are their efficiencies? Um, that came through in some of their presentations, but not all. Uh, from there, we had a budget that initially was over 11%. We knew that that needed to be reduced. So in the January, early February timeframe, uh, we had several meetings with that team to bring that 11% down. Um, prioritizing the long list that they came up with, uh, from personnel to uh, B account increases, um, taking a good look at things that we perhaps didn't need that were in the existing budget, where are their current efficiencies, um, and that brought us to the budget book, which was at 7.33% that was presented to the school committee, um, I believe in late February or early March. Um, we had multiple uh, school committee meetings where that was uh, that number was discussed, questions were asked. Um, we did not have budget workshops in the spring. That is something that will happen going forward. Um, so what ended up happening is the budget was sort of played out um, in a typical school committee meeting as opposed to a workshop setting, uh, which we will not do going forward. Um, the school committee voted in April. It was a tie vote. Uh, the budget went to the mayor's office. Uh, both Leanne and I met with the mayor and the city auditor uh, on multiple occasions over about a three-week period. And the mayor in, in May provided us with her recommendation to the city council. Again, our team convened on our end knowing that we needed to find a way to reduce that request. So over about a two-week period uh, and included in there two workshops with the school committee one on a Monday, one on the following Tuesday. It was a Tuesday because it was a Monday holiday. Uh, we came up with the number that you have now in front of you and presented that to the school committee in their meeting of June 1st. Thank you. So if, if, this evening, if you're asked for your recommendation by the school committee in a vote in which proposal is made, whether or not that money should be restored, are you going to give them a recommendation? My recommendation, if that vote is up for consideration, would be that we do not restore the money. Thank you. So I, so fine. Next, I want to ask you another question. Um, this, this document that we received a few weeks ago, along with my budget, the budget that Leanne, was, Ms. Wilsinski sent us, which is this budget, this document, how does this differ from this document? So this document was, was reviewed, and so I've looked at both of these, I've read them both, but this document, which is uh, a class center detail report, this document went to our long-term debt committee, which I did not attend last Monday, but the long-term debt committee reviewed this document. This is, again, in my recollection of doing things like this, this has never really happened to us before, so I'm not sure what the difference is between this document and this one. The, the report in your right hand is the cost center line item detail that should have been included in the budget book that you're holding in your left hand. When it was went to the printer, it was not that section was not 
printed in the book. Okay. So it was sent All separately. Right. Okay. So then in that case, now I understand. So um, I'm looking for the request. What am I? I threw it in my book. Here it is. Okay. So that request said, attached to additional pages for the FY 2023 school department budget book that were not included in the original document you received. The section is titled Cost Center Detail Report. Okay. And that's not in here. That's not printed in that book. But okay. So let me, let me go back to the formulation. I, I appreciate your process. Um, I'm not necessarily going to agree with you, knowing the Ed Reform Act as I do, and the fact that you're still obligated to um, adhere to the, the, the rubrics that came out of that Ed Reform Act of uh, 1993. So if I were to change the name of this cost center detail report, would I say, would a different name for it be um, instead of cost center, would, would, would it be foundation detail report? I don't, I don't know that that is necessarily accurate. So are you supposed to adhere to the foundation, the formulation of the school department's budget as the foundation budget? I'm not really sure what, <laughs> what you're what number you would tr be trying to get to. That Not, I'm trying to get to the, 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 the framework under which every city and town is supposed to formulate a budget for their schools. And it's supposed to be a foundation budget. In this case, we have eight foundations, then we have a high school foundation, and then we have a dual language and then a supplemental foundation. So we have 11 foundations, 11 footprints in this city that provide an educational form, uh, formula and, and uh, atmosphere for our students, right? Right, so in that cost center detail report though, there's also supportive services that Stop right there. That's what I'm trying to get to. Exactly what I'm trying to get to. So the foundation budget is supposed to be formulated from the ground up for everything that goes on in each of those 11 foundations. Then, the add-ons come. And I want to make sure everybody understands their add-ons. And why do I want to make that understood? Because in our budget, again, the big budget, if you go to the page that's after the page I referenced earlier, please, if you would go to that page. What you're going to see is, I'll find it here. So after the page that I referenced earlier, which had to do with the city side, school side, comparison costs and what's taken from the indirect cost on the city side, put over on the school side, then you have to go to a page that I star every year because many of the other councils have referred to it, but they haven't got quite to the really bottom line impact here. So it says on this page, for at home, those of you who can't see it, so the school budget, net of transportation, the transportation is not in this budget because we, we, we vote each of these budgets separately next week when and if we pass a budget this year. I'm not sure that's going to happen at the rate we're going. Um, <clears throat> so next week when we vote, we have six separate votes that we take as a city council. Each vote has an order attached to it. That order then compiled then ends up being our operating budget for next fiscal. Now, school budget, net of transportation, no transportation in this, $93,431,389. The school indirect costs included in the city budget, $35,370,000. So the total of your budget is 128 
$1,801,389. But DESE, the almighty Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, quasi-governmental authority, requires you, us, we, that we must, must spend $87,977,903. So what happens? We are in excess of what DESE says it takes to educate every child in our schools. We are over that by $40 million in excess of net school spending. Think about that. If I did that in my personal budget, I don't know where I'd be. No roof, no kitchen, no house. And it's been this way for a long time. So, in the formulation of your budget, I think, as the council to my right suggested, <coughs> I think next year, once and if we ever get through this exercise, I think next year you have a lot of soul searching to do in the terms of formulating your budget. The schools really have a lot of reflection to do. Because I have stories just like this council here. Horror stories. Now, can you tell me why are we $40 million over net school spending? What's the, why are we 40? Is it, I'm, I didn't hear your That's question. That's what I Sorry. asked you. Why are we $40 million over net school spending? Yeah. I mean, I know the health insurance cost is very high for the city. This is, I mean, we have the best benefits uh, going anywhere, right? So that that's a that's a large cost. That Do the teachers know that? Madam President, I think I think the right ones do, yes, but I think some of them maybe don't. Maybe understand. they need to have somebody like me come and visit. And not threaten me through emails. Because I don't threaten easily. The only thing they can do to me is take me out of this job. And nothing more. So if you can't give me a reason why we're 40 million, that's not a good, a good enough excuse to me. I mean, 40 million dollars is not, it's not because of the, of the indirect cost or the benefits. It's gotta be other reasons why we're 40 million dollars over net school spending. I, I, I just, I'm not prepared to answer that in detail. Thank I you would for, have to. I appreciate your honesty. I don't want so to. I'm expecting you, you have homework for me and I'll be checking on you next year. And I didn't last 35 years in the Boston Public Schools because I was an easy teacher. And every child I ever taught could read and write and think and speak. Now, could you tell me, please, what role does the mayor have in creating this budget? Do you know, Superintendent Regan? Uh, I mean, to the extent that she participates in school committee meetings, she can participate there. If we have budget She's workshops, she would, yes. and she could participate in workshops with us if we held workshops. Um, and then just the two cycles that I've gone through, my understanding and what I've seen is that the budget is then voted, sent to her office, and then she continues to do work there, and then includes Leanne and I in those conversations. Okay. After the Ed Reform Act of 1993, what role does the school committee have in this budget? Well, it is, it is their budget. This is the... I disagree with you. Okay. Have you ever read that act? Not in its entirety, no. But I spoke to you after you became superintendent, and I gave you a very, very, very cogent comment. And that is that you are in control of everything. They are only in control of you. 
nothing more. They cannot hire, nor can they fire. Only one person. Mm -hmm. You do the hiring. Those of you who, those of your employees who you appoint as principals do the hiring in the schools. That's part of the foundation budget. This is all under the foundation budget of the Education Reform Act. Mm -hmm. So you have con entire control of the Waltham mm -hmm. Public Schools. It's your job. They only oversee you. Now, I just gave you your order. My next question is, what role do you have in this budget? Basically, it's your budget. And since you didn't have too many workshops, it's your budget. So I'm glad you're not recommending adding more money to it. Now, what role do we have in this budget? We have absolutely zero. The only thing we can do, we can add if the school committee asks us to. We could add. We could take a vote to do that. It would take 10 of us to do that. I'm not sure it would happen. I don't know. I will have to wait and see. I won't even make a prediction. Other than that, prior to Prop 2 and a half, which was passed in 1981 by the voters of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, prior to that, legislative bodies had a great deal of um, uh, influence, if you will, on a school department's budget. That is no longer. We have very little control of it. We have no review of it, no oversight of it, nothing. We're only asked to provide the money. And um, as the counsel to my right spoke very truthfully about, this is your second or third year here. This is my sixth decade, maybe seventh. I guess I'm in my seventh. And as he said, um, during the last eight years, the, the schools have created a great division in the community that has yet to heal throughout the community. And it, the schools created um, a very um, difficult flashpoint for the way people look at education in the city. Um, the mayor had a vision. She had a vision all along. All along since she was on the school committee many, many, many years ago when the two high schools that we had, the vocational high school down next to McDevitt and the regular Waltham High up on the hill, were two separate schools with two separate groups of youngsters almost all living in the same city, but almost divided in how they received their education. And that didn't set well with her. And she and I have talked educational uh, philosophy and psychology for many, many, many years. It did not set well with her. And she felt at that time, coming from that school committee experience, that youngsters should be all together. And that was her vision for the new high school. Mm. But. Everybody else had a thought on that. So for six years, many of the elected officials in the city debated, discussed, and we finally came to uh, a decision four years ago. Very difficult decision, but it divided the community tremendously. Education never did that before. And so, we have very little authority on this budget. All we do is provide the money, and we don't even do that. We look to the auditor to make sure we, we, we have the ability to do that. And I already said to both him and the mayor years ago, I would not ever vote for an outside section. Do you know what that means? I do not. So Arlington voted for an outside section. Belmont voted for an outside section. I can tell you other communities that did. What it, did, what it means is you go outside the, 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 the acceptable process of the budget for a Proposition 2 and a half override. Arlington, the people in Arlington have $1,000 a year added to their taxes for the next 22 years to pay for their school. Outside of their ordinary budget. The people in Belmont have the same thing for their new schools. We do not. That mayor managed, through her administrative capability, and critical thinking skills 
to get us, along with the auditor's department, in concert to eight new schools, no outside section, all within the capital and operating budget over a 25-year time, paid for in two years. Unheard of. And I think we all intend to do the same thing for this new high school. But not if we continue down the path that I, I see things going. And I think, I think at this point, I, I really think, I have, I'm sorry to tell you this, I have a lot of questions more. Thank you, Mr. Chief, for allowing me. Very welcome. I am more. We'll hold that thought for one second. Ms. Wolzinski, Mr. Dr. Egan, she said, uh, the president says she has more questions. I have three more speakers. Do you need a break? Do you need to use the facilities or anything? Take a break. You're all set? Okay, thank you. Please proceed, Madam President. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So, um, in, your, in your budgeting uh, principles in the school department, Ms. Wilsinski can probably address this. Uh, just like we have on the city side, uh, an A and a B and a C budget, but the A and the B are the real drivers. In the A, we can only... Um, line item transfer within the A and line item transfer within the B. Can you explain to us how that works for you for the school side of the budget um, within your A account and then within your B account? How are you able to maneuver through each of those categories? We manage it the same way that the city manages their budget. By cost center, there's an A account and a B account within each cost center. And if we need additional funds for either of those categories within a cost center, we would go to school committee and request a funding transfer. So let's let's just say, I think you gave the council a two hundred thousand dollar ballpark that um, you have uh, budgeted for um, substitutes, right? Yeah, that's what we've been spending. The okay, so let's say yeah. let's say you budgeted two hundred thousand dollars and you spend it. So let's say you budgeted for it. Okay. Okay, uh, what account is that in your A or B? It's in an A account. It's in a, okay, so let me ask you this. So let's say uh, something happens in your A account that you're overrun in another area. Can you take any money that's left over in that um, substitute account and use it in another way in the A account? If it's in a different cost center, we would go to school committee and request a funding transfer. But if it's in the same cost center? If it's within the same cost center, I, th I think there, there's some flexibility to use it for another purpose, but I mean, that's a, shifting it from a, an account specifically for substitutes to create another full-time position wouldn't be appropriate. So that's something that would be brought to school committee. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily, based on you know, those parameters, require a funding transfer, but we wouldn't do something like what that. What about on a B account? So within B account, again, it's bottom line B account, and as long as we're within the budget, I think that I know that that's how the city manages um, the B accounts. As long as we're within that budget, we wouldn't go to school committee with a so, funding okay, transfer. So, okay, exactly. So I'll give you an example. Let's say on the city side, let's say um, one of the departments has an early retirement in January, but was budgeted for a full-time salary and benefits, et cetera, to June of fiscal, fiscal June 30th. So now they've got six months worth of money unused, mm -hmm. that they don't have to account to anybody for. Do you have that flexibility in your budgeting? I would say with, if it's within the cost center, then there is that flexibility, but to create a new position. I didn't ask about new positions. I said, yeah. what flexibility do you have move, to there move would money be that, around? Yes, there yeah. would be that flexibility. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so, um, Excuse me just a minute till I go to my notes here. <clears throat> I had it folded over. So in, in, in the significant trends, events, and initiatives, um, that you originally, or that you gave us to, to here, as you said here, as, and I start this, as salaries make up approximately 85% of the Waltham School's operating budget. So I just gave you, so, so basically what I gave you 
was the amount of money and the fact that you're $40 million over net school spending, but you're telling us in this budget that salaries make up approximately 85% of your operating budget. Is that a fact? That's correct. So the teachers are costing your budget 85% of the money? Are the teachers and the, the ancillary personnel related? Yes, and that's typical of school budgets. That, that's a, a number that is common among any school, public school budget that you would see. So then you only have 15% left over to do all the other things in the schools that you have to do? Yes. That's an inequity. I'm reading equity all over the place. Equity comes in a lot of categories. Um, let's see here. And the counselor to my left brought up a, a, a topic here. And, and again, this, this is a stock piece of data. Um, no, I'm sorry, let me back up a second. Counselor to my right talked about the buses. So I have two stories to tell. First story, and they're all related. <clears throat> First story is I walk every day, except for today. I walk every single day at the Pan Estate. I have a mile route. It's a long route, short route, doesn't matter. Three weeks ago, I was walking through the Payne Estate, 12 o'clock noon, four young boys, Latino boys, came towards me. Lost. So they told me. But they didn't speak any English. So all I could figure out, since I don't speak Spanish, is la escuela o la casa. Where are you four going? Stop. La escuela o la casa? Oh, la casa. I said, it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon. You're not going home. What, you, what is this? Follow me. My teacher, follow me. So the four of them got behind me like the Pied Piper and my dog, and off we go through the pain estate. You can picture this. You picture I get to the top of the hill and I meet four more boys. Now I have eight following me out of the high school at 12 o'clock. Going home to La Casa. Now, I have a little dialogue with one of the teachers up there who happens to be in the science department who's taking their students for a walk in the place to sort of sort out what's happening here. And I'm told by the teacher, I'll take care of this. I said, I'll, I'll take care of this with Ms. Pena. I will have a conversation which I have had with Ms. Pena. That's why you've got golf carts going around your high school. Because this doesn't happen just once. This is a daily occurrence all through the pain estate. And I'm not even going to tell you some of the other stories about it. However, what even flabbergasted me more is when I left the eight students who had left, plus the ten who were with this teacher, that's 18 students heading back to the high school. And I get in my car with my dog to leave the pain estate and headed down the hill. Two things. First thing is, I headed to Bentley and headed up Forest Street and here are the four boys coming down Forest Street. They never even went back to the high school. So needless to say, the teacher pulled right up in me. I got out of the car, screaming and yelling, and they were laughing. La casa, la casa. I was not laughing. <laughs> and I didn't want them punished. And I told the teacher who I met I didn't want them punished. That is an exercise in futility. So now they're out of school for an extra two hours, and you're going to punish them for another hour and keep them in school learning nothing, doing nothing, no production. Then, in addition to that, when I come down that hill every day, from the pain estate and have to wait for the school buses when they exit the high school every single day at 1.20, 20 minutes of 2, whatever time they get out. Twelve of them go by me. There's not a student on the bus. They are empty. I watched this happen when I taught at Charlestown High 
when busing was mandated and mandatory and 18 buses left that high school every single day empty because the kids wouldn't ride them. It's a waste of money. Not that I don't want them to have the buses, of course I do. But somebody needs to monitor the whole process. And I have other stories. But I've taken a lot of time here. And I hope I've made a point, Dr. Regan. You are new here. This is your second year. This has been a very difficult afternoon for you, I am sure. I won't apologize for it because it's a long time coming. But I hope in your stature as the chief executive of the schools that our youngsters go to, that you take everything we have asked you or told you here this afternoon and you take that back and think long and hard. We want you to succeed. We want our youngsters to succeed. We are a wonderful community and they are, they are our gems. And so I hope you will take away from here, not be angry at us, even though we sound angry. Don't, don't be angry at us. It's the only way we feel we have to get across to you how serious this all is. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam President. Off committee, Councilor Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Dr. Regan. Uh, my question is really simple, um, but I'm not sure what the drivers are behind it, so I'm hoping that you can explain. Um, projected enrollment for K through 5 and 6 through 8 are negative, negative 2 plus percent. How do we get, what are the drivers that get us to high school enrollment at plus 1.29 percent. What are the drivers behind that and the phenomenon behind that? And are we talking about just matriculating freshmen, not including dropouts, just first day of freshman year? Uh, yes, I believe those, the second part of your question, yes, we're not necessarily calculating dropout into that, so this is matriculating freshmen. Um, are you asking why sort of the secondary level seems to be going one direction and the other level's going another? Right. Um, you know, I think that, I, I can't explain this, but when we see sort of the churn of our population of students, uh, we see more mobility at the secondary level for one reason or another. Um, and when we have um, new enrollments come in, uh, you know, we have several that are sort of in the queue right now. I think you would note that most of them, or the majority of them, tend to fall at the secondary level. I can't explain that phenomenon or why that is. Um, but that's what we sort of see on a, on a regular basis. We see more mobility of, of our older students. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that NESDEC provides us the, the data this way and they break it out by th three different levels because it's, again, it sort of doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If K-8 is going down, why all of a sudden does it jump up? But mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have the information as to why that is the case, but I know that you know, when you see enrollments happen, um, there's more sort of mobility that's happening at the secondary level. We have more students that are enrolling um, there than we may see at the elementary. And isn't that typically the time of schooling where students peel off and end up going to private schools if they are going to go to private schools? Uh, it does, yeah. I think the eighth to ninth grade transition is a pretty common time, and that's the same for, I think, a lot of communities because there are a lot more options out there for, um, well, it's not more options, but there are, you know, you see uh, students peel off in ninth grade to go to either prep schools or private schools. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. But yet um, the numbers are the numbers showing are, higher. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, I, again, I. It's 17, the projection is 1777 to 1800. It's not a, an enormous increase. It is an increase nonetheless. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, that impact on the overall high school program will be relatively minimal. If you think about 23 students, if that were to come to fruition this way, right. it's not gonna have a significant uh, impact. I think what you don't see in this number, particularly at the high school, I used the word churn earlier, which is something that the Department of Education tracks now. That's sort of the in and out of students. And you know that 
you know, doesn't look like on paper like there's much of an impact in enrollment at the high school, for example, but there is because you've got this constant mobility of students going in and out of, um, in and out of the enrollment um, number. So, and in, in, in typically, let's say if, if they're English learners, for example, you have churn out of English learners that are at a higher English proficiency level now because they've been in school for a while than our newcomers that are coming in. So it's, it, 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 it makes that um, an even more interesting puzzle to put together because you've got to provide different services for the kids coming in than the kids going out. So that, um, that can be, um, it's just an interesting piece that we have to be monitoring very closely. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to piggyback a little bit on uh, what the counselor from Linden Circle uh, brought up, which is, can you tell me how us, how many um, CTE students we serve now? Oh, I should have brought that number with me. I don't have that number. I'm afraid I don't have that at the top of my head, counselor, but I can get that to you guys. I can get that to the board. Okay. Um, can you explain why, um, and I don't, I'm not 100% sure if there's some sort of driver behind this, but um, there are three students um, that were sent out of the district under Chapter 74. Mm -hmm. um, two are going to Minuteman High and one to an agricultural school. Uh, that's not... That's not everybody. That's just three we couldn't service. Or how does that work? Because we're we're building a new school with, dare I say, ten to fifteen percent building dedicated to um, this new avenue for vocational. But if there aren't that many students to fill it, how you know are we justifying that? Yeah. So I, I think back to um, Councilor Blank's point, um, and I've had a conversation with the mayor about this as well. Uh, Somerville found this out. They didn't staff their programs ahead of time, and that's what we need to think about doing. So HVAC is a good example, HVAC. That's a new program. If we try and hire the teacher on the year that that shop's going to open, we're not going to have students necessarily in the shop for the program. So what, and this is what Somerville learned through their process, and I've been, um, I know their superintendent and, and plan to communicate with her directly about this. If you hire that teacher ahead of time, and, and this gets tricky because now you're trying to add a teacher where there isn't a program live yet, but that teacher would then have the year to do the appropriate recruitment with grade eight so that when that cohort gets to ninth grade, we have the appropriate uh, number of students to begin the program. And you're only gonna start with a cohort in grade nine and build it up because CTE works that way. You can't have nine through 12 sort of all join the, the, the uh, program at the same time necessarily. So that's one thing that we need to think about as we plan ahead um, for staffing. And the mayor has asked us for as much detail as we can give her around the, the ramp up of these new programs and at the same time the expansion of some of our existing programs. Mm -hmm. um, to the point about the three students that are going out, that process, uh, and the state has done a lot in recent years to try and protect local districts so that, you know, you can have some control over those, the, the, you know, the, the outflow of students to tech schools. But now that we have a, a Chapter 74, that's the, 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 the legislation that oversees uh, career tech ed, we have Chapter 74 approved um, exploratory program. If you're a freshman at the high school and you're interested in a shop that we don't have, but they have at Minuteman, you still go through our exploratory program in freshman year. And at the end of that program, if you don't find one of ours to be of interest to you, then you can appeal to go to Minuteman where they might have currently HVAC and we don't. Um, and there's a process that they fill out to go through that. And that, that the system in place, I think, is what, and the fact that we have so many programs already, is what keeps that number low for us at three. Agricultural programs are sort of in a category all their own because there are just very few schools that have true Aggie programs. And if you have a student that wants that, um, you know, even in those cases, that, that's one of the exceptions that you can, you don't necessarily need to do the um, exploratory because, the, you know, that's, it's such a unique program. Um, so we follow those procedures really closely and 
it frustrates parents sometimes because they feel, you know, that their children, understandably, have an interest in this one thing and you're telling me we have to wait a year and then they do run the risk of, of what if there isn't room at that particular tech school. Um, so um, it, it, it can be a frustrating process, but we do follow that very closely to make sure that they avail themselves of the programs that we have and that we're very proud of in Waltham. And I think based on the numbers of kids that are going out, it, it, I think it works. I think it, it allows kids to see what's available to them here. And ultimately, most I think most high school students would rather stay with their peer group and be in their home community if they can. So that works in our, in, to our advantage. So in some way, you could look at the, um, the investment that we're putting in to the new high school for these robust um, curricula, you know, this the CTE curriculum is sort of a build it and they will come because we're going to be actively recruiting this earlier on in the education process. I think you're right. That needs to be a key component as we ramp up next year and the year after to get ready for that building to open to start building, particularly the new programs. Right. You know, right now in our carpentry, carpentry program or our electrical program or our auto, automotive program, there's we have more than uh, more kids than we have seats. Okay. Right. So you know, there I'd are like other. I'd like to know if you could follow up with how many kids actually yeah, can you know you are on numbers. that track. Mm -hmm. I can give you those numbers. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I don't have any other further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Dunn. Off committee, Councilor Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just generally, uh, and thank you, Mr. Superintendent, for being here. Uh, I'm just generally concerned by the lack of. Um, I think ambition and urgency we're seeing in this budget. I was a little bit more of a fan of the original one that you proposed. Um, just to quote, you know, your opening message here. Um, you know, the initial budget that you proposed had a one percent, less than one percent increase for new staffing, programming, supplies, and materials. That was your original budget, less than one percent. Right? What have we learned after COVID? You would think that we would want to carry some lessons forward, maybe switch some things around, um, improve upon the experience we had with virtual education, and we have cut that 1% even further. Um, you said that the FY23 represents an increase of 7.33% over the current fiscal year, and then fast forward, just to level service, right, this budget, we would need 6.4%. This is your words. This is your statement, right? So what we have in front of us, because I can't speculate what another legislative body is going to do, we're looking at a 5%, which is not even level service. I, I just want to make sure that folks at home are understanding that the initial budget that we had was less than 1% has been cut. Um, and that's very concerning. I think we need to think big. We need to go big. We're about to have a state-of-the-art high school, and we need to think about what we need to leave behind, what we can improve upon. I, I appreciate the frustration of counselors here. If you're angry, then that means you care. Uh, I may not agree with some of the ways that we're arriving to our conclusions, but uh, I want to echo um, a few things I've heard from educators and some students that I've talked to in my time. Um, teachers are feeling burnt out. Uh, they're feeling underpaid, overworked, uh, not giving adequate resources. I've heard of horror stories of you know educators in the middle school who had to fight to get you know any copies in the copy machine. There's issues with those machines. Um, you know there's you know inflation's happening. There's a rise in those costs, right? There's a rise in the cost of living for those teachers, and we're going to call them the backbone to our you know our education system. I think we need to uh, make sure that they feel heard. And that comes in a few forms. Uh, I just want to echo, because I wouldn't be doing my job if I don't echo what I've heard from students. There's a lack of a multicultural cu curriculum. Uh, we have a very diverse student body, and we don't tend to educate uh, people in the way that they see themselves. Um, there's a, la a lack of alternate pathways to graduation. That's really something that makes me angry. Uh, lack of course options in the arts. And just, if we're going to talk about disengagement, right? Kids skipping class, dropping out misbehaving. Um, it's been two years of online learning. Everyone's dealing with this, but we need to be proactive and not just reactive and try to have a punitive approach. We need to make sure that students feel heard and engaged. Um, more specifically, we're discontinuing the Change Makers program, which has been proven to be a pretty effective, um, I think, program. Uh, the Waltham Opportunity Institute, why are we cutting that? And why did we set it up to fail? Um, 
There's no real serious, I want to echo what the counselor at large talked about CTE, um, career and technical education. Uh, we don't even have the numbers of students that have that, but um, you know, graduation can look in many forms and college is not for everyone. Uh, so that's very concerning. Um, and I want to just bring it back to the dropout rate and why the Waltham Opportunity Institute is so important. One in 25 of our freshmen, as we speak, are going to drop out. That's what 4% means, one in 25. We're going to look at them straight in the face. We're going to say, hey, there's going to be an achievement gap here. And then on top of that, one out of 25 are going to fail. So Mr. Superintendent, I, I want to echo the words of uh, Mr. Uh, school Committee member, Mr. Tarallo, in that we need a night school program. We have a lot of socioeconomically disadvantaged students, a lot of students who work, who want to get, who want to graduate. And we understaffed and underfunded that program. That's why it failed. So just to, you know, make this clear, to get a GRE, you need to at least have some kind of capacity to cover four courses. I'm telling you something you probably already know. History, English, math, and the sciences, right? You at least need one program coordinator and one guidance counselor, right? Because these students come with different needs. They need different socio-emotional uh, kind of support. So we gave 1.5 staff to that. We switched some people around who were already burnt out, stretched thin, and we saw the money run out. And we said, everyone go home. It was like 14 or 15 kids who took part. We could have had 100. And I, and I really disagree with folks in the school committee. I, I don't want to name names. People who think, well, we need to assess and evaluate this and make sure that before we get this started, we need to know the need. Have you not looked around the student body? If you're asking if we need a night school program, you're not paying attention, respectfully. You're not. There's a lot of poor kids. A lot of people are working. People want to graduate. They want to make a living. They want to survive. They want to graduate. And we're, not, we're punishing them for that by not providing that program. So I, I really I want to keep my remarks clear, and I do have some questions. Um, but I, I want to impart, while the school committee members are here, to listen to their colleague, Mr. Tarallo. Um, and I, I don't think 30K is enough. Because what I just enumerated, four courses, that means four educators, one program coordinator, and one guidance counselor, that's six. That's a bare bone program. There's a lot of success stories across the Commonwealth of people having day schools, night schools, and people don't have to make a hard decision whether to go to school or drop out. Again, the number is one out of 25 are dropping out, and that's just who we can count. You know that there's more. You know that people are taking longer, and that's more resources out of our school budget. Um, I want to know, because these are things that I, I don't know, um, why are we recruiting to fill pos open positions, like, let's say, substitute teachers? Why is that a struggle? Well, I mean, I think that the pool of applicants in general for those kinds of jobs are down across the state. There's just, the, the people aren't there. We're seeing the same thing for paraprofessionals, and our paraprofessional rate of pay is is better than a lot of our competing communities. Our benefits package is far better than many of our uh, area communities, but we're still not seeing, and we're using not just the typical um, recruitment tools. We're going through places like Monster and Indeed and other uh, sites to try and attract uh, candidates that may not look at School Spring as what sort of the typical educational um, site to use, right? But we're trying to go other directions, too, so that we might attract other candidates. Word of mouth, um, you know, uh, job fairs. Like, we're, we're attending all of these things to try and grab these candidates and get them in. And it, it's it's unique this year that that, that we're not, we literally will post something two, three times, and there'll be zero applicants for the job. Um, and that's not unique to us. That's, I'm hearing this from superintendents that I'm talking to all over the place. Our openings are very small compared to some districts that are our size that have hundreds of vacancies that are sitting just in, a, in the classroom that are, that are empty. We're fortunate that most of ours are, um, you know, positions that we're able to get by with right now, but it's a struggle. I mean, it's putting pressure on others in the, in the school where the vacancy is to provide coverage or yeah. That leads well to my next question. Um, a recent survey of our educators showed that roughly 30% of Waltham educators are taking steps to leave the district. How does this budget attract and retain high quality educators? 
So that's the first I'm hearing of that. I don't know what that survey is. Sorry, so, this uh, is the first time. That's okay. Time. No, I'm just. I'm I know just you're the messenger. That's, uh, I get it. That's that's yeah. Um, you know, look, I, I think that the narrative that's been played out there by the teachers union and um, I think the MTA is that this $2.2 million represents a cut to services, but in reality, uh, we were able to shift those, some many of those positions over to the grant, uh, the ESSER grant. So we, we are not eliminating teaching positions in the district. Um, if I can jump in there, Dr. Regan, I I know you're not the only decision maker, so I want to be fair for folks back at home. I, I know you have to balance a lot of interest in decision makers. Um, <clears throat> the reduction in your original budget which again, I'm a fan of, except for the fact that you cut out Waltham Opportunity Institute. Um, that reduction of 12 staff, our proposed staff that in your original mind, you imagined that you needed 12 more staff, right? So that means that the existing staff are gonna be stretched thinner because we will not have those 12 proposed staff. Um, the shifts of 16, 16.25, these things, these numbers are weird, but 16.25 from general to grant, that means that when the money runs out, those positions are gone, right? That means that we have to make that decision whether they're gone or that we're trying to roll them back into FY24. Right. Yeah. So, but most of those are enrollment, tied to enrollment, so I think to... Which think enrollment, which respectfully, we're looking at the enrollment of like a year ago, October, when we were doing online learning, right? So a uh, mix of hybrid... The, no, the numbers that we have were based on this spring. They, they, there's the enrollment projections we have are based on yeah. enrollment as of this spring. Yeah, I just, I, I'm not a fan of that, you know, enrollment equals necessity. I think that's a scapegoating way of saying that because it's not a fire right now, we will not have an increase or change in the enrollment. Um, that doesn't seem to make sense to me. Uh, you would want to provide, let's say, a variety of courses and a variety of staff to support whatever scenarios arise. and. By limiting those positions to grants, that means that in the future, again, to quote the Ward 1 counselor, we're kicking the can down the road. Um, and that's not a way to have a quality, excellent education. Um, I, again, I think I lost my point here. Hold on. Um, I, I, again, just want to make this, this thing loud and clear. Um, I think every student has the capacity to be brilliant. Um, and they need resources. I think everyone knows that we have issues with Wi-Fi. There's a digital equity gap. Um, where in the budget are there increases or improvements in the Wi-Fi capacities of our schools? Do we have anything for Wi-Fi specifically when we have the devices? Yeah. So uh, when you say Wi-Fi, Councilor Paz, are you talking about within our facilities? Within or the facilities, yeah. yes. Yeah, so our, our Wi-Fi in, in our buildings is is adequate for what we have. We do have uh, funding in the budget. Uh, this is grant funding for the, the devices. So grant funding for um, an upgrade um, of devices. And our students, um, uh, grades two and up, will have the one-to-one -on -one, one -to -one, uh, capacity. So um, what happened to the hotspots that we gave out? So we have, mo we have many of them back. Some of them were not retrieved because they were MIA. They, they are MIA. Um, they're not functional <coughs> our dime anymore because the, the the plans that were with them have expired. So uh, we allowed that contract to expire. For the yes, for the yes, yes. But we still have the devices, uh, but we, right, we're so, not distributing them, so to speak, right yeah, now. Yeah. So just to make make that clear, so we took those devices back. We allowed the contract to expire, but that need with those students is still there, right? If, we if, if you're saying that, that there are stu you're saying that there are students in the city that do not have access to Wi-Fi at home, right? That's yes, what we're that's, saying. That's correct. That's yes. the consequence of not, you know, maybe extending that contract, right? Right. And we expect excellence out of these students. Okay. Um, yeah. Just the last thing I I'd like to just know what's the average class size in our middle schools? Um, I think this number here, 13.5 average class size, is, is is very generous. I think. Where you say? Oh, yeah, that's a that's a broader number. Uh, sorry, oh, that's not in this book, is it? The middle school, All right? And we wish we. I want to say that that what we're aiming for is between 22 and 25 per section. That's when we build the teams. The number they're looking for. 
the principals are 25 to be sort of the max number. When and what's the average class size in our high school? That's a hard number to crack right now, so I will tell you that based on, so, because this is going to be talked about tonight at school committee, next year's schedule, which is um, what's being built now, the average in our MESH classes, right, so that's our math, English, uh, science, and history classes, ranges from a low of 16 to a high of 23.4, I think, or 24. Um, and in our college prep classes, the high number is a little bit lower than that, so 16 to 21. Um, so that's for our, our core academic classes, which again, I, I, in my experience as an educator over 24 years, those are, those are really strong class size numbers. Those are good, those are good numbers. Yeah, thank you. I, I think just the last question, I've, I've heard this from someone and I just want to know if it's true. I've heard that there's one guidance counselor for 600 students at Northeast. Is that? No, that would not be correct. Okay. No. What's the, what's the, the ratio? The enrollment there? at Northeast is not that high. Um, How many students or? Uh, what's the ratio there of like guidance counselors to 55. students? 55. Uh, I don't know what they have there. I'd have to look it up in the book to see exactly what they have for, for counselors and, and uh, SACs. You know, we've received a lot of correspondence, so I just wanted to, yep. you know. I'm just looking. Oh, that's the wrong page. Hang on. If you give me one second. Uh, on the right page here, I just want to find the... At Northeast there. Oops. There is one sack. There's one sack. Yeah, so there's one school adjustment counselor assigned to Northeast. Um, and the enrollment there is about 460. So one counselor for 460 students. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we also have district-wide counselors that are deployed to all schools that right. help right. offset that. Does that seem like a problem to you? I'm just curious in that ratio, one to 460. Um, for, for an elementary school to have one school adjustment counselor, no, I don't think that's unusual, um, particularly since we do have um, district-wide positions that can come in and relieve any additional supports or testing or group that they need to do. Yeah. I mean, I think anyone could argue that more is better if you you know if you have more school adjustment councils but that model is used in our elementaries across the district yeah I just um, I think that's it on my part I just want to impart again that um, there's a desperate need to I think rethink this budget in a way that <clears throat> sets our students to succeed and not to fail um, and again I think we need to bring back the Waltham Opportunity Institute Mr. Dr. Regan I really urge you to look into that yourself in the future because I, the reports I'm getting, it's that it wasn't a high priority for you, and I, and I really hope that that's, you know, an overstatement and a mischaracterization. I hope it's something that we respect and honor that these students have socioeconomic needs and that they need alternate pathways to graduation. So I, I, I appreciate you indulging me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lopez. <clears throat> Dr. Eden, Ms. Wilsinski, you have two more speakers. Are you still all still need to use facilities? No break? Good. Off committee, Councilor Harris. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here today. Um, I want to ask a couple of questions about uh, the shift in to ESSER. So before we get into that, what was the total shift in the budget in the other government-funded opportunity that we took advantage of called COVID? What was the dollar amount of the budget? Because we, we shifted a lot of last year's budget to COVID. <coughs> Oh, so you want to know what we shifted last yeah, year? I want to know what you shifted last year. For ESSER, for COVID relief, it was about, about a month. Does that, that, that include the um, circuit breaker? No, that was okay. the... So it was $1.4 million then. Okay. So, and this year it's one point five two eight five six for purposes of people who don't have this piece of paper in front of them. So can we talk about what qualifies a shift in the budget to ESSER? So what are the categories of costs that can move? So you, there are um, a certain amount of your ESSER funds needs to be spent around, <clears throat> excuse me, social emotional learning. A certain percentage needs to be spent around sort of operational or PPE, and the rest is around sort of the, the broader umbrella of, of academic um, programming. Okay. Which is the biggest pot. Of okay. Three. 
So this is in line, you know, because you, you raised earlier the social emotional challenges of some of the students in the school and how that might be a barrier to their success. This might be a very direct question and hopefully you can answer it. Otherwise, I would want this answer before this budget comes back. Uh, is that of the 6.25 FTEs that you, you shifted to general fund ESSER, how much of that percentage and dollar is tied to supporting the social emotional needs of our students? Because if that is a qualification, I'd like to know how much of that we shifted to support the students. So I would say of the 16.25 FTE, yeah. n none of those positions are, would be sort of classified, I think, as SEL because they're, they're not school adjustment counselors. I mean, we do have one CNA, um, which you probably could put under that category. Okay. But um, the positions are primarily classroom type teaching positions. So, so they were they were teaching positions where any of them were any of them substitute teaching positions? No. Do substitute teaching uh, salaries qualify for ESSER? We were using some ESSER funds to supplement our building to add building based substitutes during during COVID. So you've been encouraged to go back and reconsider the budget and under that reconsideration, I know there's a meeting that follows here. I certainly hope we don't add back in 2.1. What I hope we do is find a way to balance this budget and um, that we look at, you know, if you take your opening statement in your budget, and I, I know you took a, a little bit of a t t task today in front of the council, but what I, what I saw here is that, that you, read, you read here, I am thankful that the Waltham Public Schools return to full-time in-person learning with very few restrictions. And the reason why you wrote that you elaborate on is because it's tied to the success of the students. If we didn't need to be in person at school, we wouldn't have built a $400 million school. We wouldn't have talked about the need to be there for many, many reasons, right? Not just Vogue Tech and not just the social aspects, but in many ways we provide, you provide the structure for a lot of these children and the norms and the um, processes under which they become productive to go forward in life. Right, whether that's to have a family, whether that's to start a small business, whether that's to go to Vogue Tech School, whether that's to go to college. And so I think what the net of, uh, you know, the question from the Ward 1 counselor, I think you were asked in a request that was voted on by this committee to bring back the total number of days missed at school. Like, you know, he asked for the, the attendance. I'd like to take that one step further. I'm really interested in, if you look at that as an average, estimate of teacher stress, of environment, of uh, juggling COVID in this post-pandemic era, which has a lot of unknowns. What kind of substitute teacher, not the 200,000 that you've earmarked, but what would you need to keep students in in-person learning, meaning that a substitute teacher would take over for that class that wouldn't be this perceived open campus that, that a substitute teacher would flow in and say, we're gonna pick up lesson X, Y, Z. Because to continue to, if we're gonna use ESSER, and we're talking about this being a kick the can, and there's a real problem with in-person learning this year, it's a new problem, we have absentees and we have no way to truly back up the teacher in the classroom. Look at what a budget would look like because this may be a new norm for school, our school, as we go through this post-pandemic era, and maybe things will stabilize and the economy gets better and, and people want to go back into teaching. But I think you've got to look at this problem this year. And if ESSER is an eligible funding source for that, this is an opportunity to nip this problem in the bud before we enter a new school. It gives you an opportunity to address, if, if, you're, if, you're, if your teacher has to be absent and the campus is open and you're an at-risk student, and you're at risk of dropping out, we're almost assuring that that's going to happen because where does the student go if I'm not a very structured learner and I'm not self-disciplined and I haven't learned those things? I go, I'm asked to go to the cafeteria. I walk out the door. And I'm not going to reiterate what the stories were. I think we've heard them. And I, I've heard them from parents very concerned with the structure of the school. And I think if, the, if you go to root cause, and I'm always you know, thinking about this even solving problems in my own ward, we got to go to where is the maximum point of impact, right, that would fix everything that happens downstream. 
you can't restructure the classroom blocks because they're too long, right? That's that, that, that horse has left the barn. But there is a way, and it's right here in your opening statement, return to full-time in-person learning. That is why we have a school. That's why we built a new school. That's why we took land. That's why we made this investment. And it is, I do believe that every person that spoke here today, came here today, watching on TV, understands that our, our schools are, are very important to the success of our community. And to me, I think if you can look at ESSER, and you could look at a way to possibly earmark what the absentees are and cover that in a gap analysis and then uh, estimate out something, that's a reason to shift more dollars to ESSER potentially this year or move money around to actually ensure the in-person learning. Because I don't want to have a debate in this room and there not be an outcome that we all can be proud of. I'm incredibly proud of, you know, the Whittemore School and the dual language program that are in my district. I, I've, I voted for the high school. I've been very supportive of the expansion of your programs because I do think they make a difference. And, and, and I'm very engaged around that and very engaged in the schools. But I think this is an opportunity. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask that, um, I know I can't make this request because I'm an off committee member. But I, I would ask, Mr. Chairman, if someone on committee could um, um, add to the counselor from Ward 1's request that they take that number of absentees and actually calculate out what a substitute gap analysis to replace um, th those classes would be so that we can put that in the budget so that we have some safety net for these students to stay in person. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Fossey, did you hear what the counselor from Ward 8 stated? I did, and I'll make a friendly amendment to the original request. Um, and add that to my request. Could you please furnish that in writing? I will. You've all heard a sense of that request? Do we need that repeated? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And then in addition to that, I did some quick math while I was sitting here, because I think if you look at like, oh, you're adding this to the budget, but I think there's something, there's another cost. It's called an opportunity lost cost. And it's the cost of what happens when you're heating the building, you've got the classroom open, um, you have a cost per capita for the student, you have an average of 20 students in the classroom, you have the teacher's salary. And I think, you know, and I'll put this in writing, but I think additionally, you, you need to calculate not just what the cost is to keep the room uh, full, but what's the opportunity loss cost if you don't. Because somebody might say just dollars and cents, well, that money's not worth it. But when you, when you actually quantify what the impact is to the student from the ratio of dollars that you want us to invest to educate the child, and the child doesn't get educated, that's a lost opportunity cost that can be quantified in dollars and cents that we should not be in the business of. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask that that calculation also be made. Councilor Fossey? We'll make another amendment to the original request. Could that please be furnished in writing? Yes, sir. Does anyone need that repeated? Yes. Could you please repeat that? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm asking, um, so, yeah, so I will be making the request. I'm asking for the, um, the superintendent um, and the administrator to actually calculate what the cost of not every day that's lost in education. So uh, they're going to give us the absentees this year. Every day that was lost, I want the cost of operating the school, the cost of educating the student per capita so you take the total cost divided by 180 days and you get a unit cost plus the teacher's salary times the number of kids in that class that's what i'm asking for because that's going to tell you what we're spending and we're getting no benefit from versus we've all heard a sense of the request from councilor fossey through councilor harris all those in favor sorry Aye. 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 opposed the ayes have it okay and i mean i, I um through you mr chairman are you guys getting at what we're trying to do here? Do you, are you picking up what we're putting down? Like it's not just to take you to the woodshed here. I'll see it in writing and then we'll have to figure it out. It's not, yeah, that report of a tent absentee isn't, isn't it's going to, yeah, we'll, we'll have to. And then my other question was, Mr. Chairman, is what is the sal average, is it an hourly salary for a substitute teacher? Can you guys just kind of explain that? On a daily, they get paid a daily they rate. Get a daily rate. And what is that rate? 125. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and I wanted to also um, ask uh, just one other question, just a baseline. You know, this will be the end of my questioning, but I'm, I'm looking for a way to build a budget to close the gap and build a bridge here just to keep students in class. may not be the end-all, be-all, but it will be better than 
at the Payne Estate or at Starbucks or somewhere else, they have an opportunity to learn, if nothing else, structure. What, um, you had $200,000 uh, earmarked in substitutes for this year's budget times the 125 rate uh, through you to either the superintendent or the administrator. How many substitute teaching opportunities is that? Okay. I have to do the math. I know. You're I'm sorry that. for the math. Sorry for the word problem so late in the day. Where's my calculator? Oh, I just want to do that by the way. 1,600 days. Okay. So we'll look at that. Um, those are the extent of my questions. And I want to thank you both for your time and um, allowing me to, to speak to them. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Harris, off committee, Councilor Dossi. Thank you very much. And I'll try to be quick, um, brief. Dr. Regan, thank you for your work that you do for our school systems. Um, the most important thing for success in life, I think anyone would say, would be education, education, and education. Um, and that being, um, do you have a short-term short -term strategic plan to address the dropout rate in our school system, the very high dropout rate? Um, and if you don't currently yeah, now, I mean, I, are you going to be working on one? One of the uh, things that we in the, I didn't bring it up today because it's a Title I funded position, we have a lot of resources, particularly at the high school, of folks that are working to support students that are um, not on track. And I've explained this at school committee meetings that the, the feeling at the high school is that there's there's not a lot of coordination of those efforts. So we're proposing using Title I funds to bring in a person that would essentially operate in that role. Uh, somebody that would be working with our dropout prevention coordinator, working with our attendance officers, working with our academic support personnel, working with our multilingual um, uh, director, uh, administrator, um, working with the parent information center for when students enroll that this person can help them, um, you know, sort of triage and make sure the, the, the newly enrolled student who may be overage and undercredited gets pointed in the right direction so they're not um, taking three months to get caught up with and then we realize that that student's lost all that time. Um, so that's one thing that is in Title I for next year um, in, in an effort to sort of pull that team together and organize their work and get them all facing in the same direction. Um, that's sort of a short-term um, thing that I can think of right now, sort of in response to your question. You say next year. When uh, for, for, for this current, uh, the next fiscal year, for fiscal next year fiscal 23, year. yes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then the other piece I would just add is we are in the process of, of creating a new um, uh, long-term strategic plan. And I have no doubt that somewhere within that plan there will be uh, action items that are related to um, dropout and, and student success overall. So Great. Um, that's um, just two things. The next question I had was to piggyback on the other counselors' question is the, um, what was the cost to continue the hotspot um, internet contract? I don't have that cost. It's, that would have been, you know what that was, Angel? I, I don't. Yeah. So if you could find, if you could figure that out and provide that to the committee. Um, and to that point, because we spent a lot of, um, money on those devices, um, could opera funds or some other funding source be used to continue that contract? And you don't have to answer right now, but if mm -hmm. you could look into this, sure. that would be great. Um, next question I had was, how many em employees work for the school department? Uh, roughly 1,000. Yeah, roughly uh, estimate 1,100 is a rough number for you. Okay, because I, I took the spreadsheet that um, Well, if you could get back to me on that, because uh, I got a different number when I, I calculated 1,071. Does that sound about right? 1,071, yeah. So yeah. I got that number from the list that Councilor, Council President McMinimum had requested, and it came in this morning. So I mm -hmm. put the list in my spreadsheet, and it calculates out that, um, as I said, there are 1,071 employees on the school department. Um, the average salary was $73,410, which 
for whatever reason, does not agree with your facts and figures on page four, which you state it's 84,000. So if you could check that number, because I got a different result. Okay. The median salary comes out to $70,476. The lowest salary was 12,114 and the highest was $216,240, just for everyone's edification. Um, that's all I have. I thank you for answering the questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for letting me speak. Thank you, Councilor Dossi. Off committee, uh, Councilor Katz. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be, I'll be very, very short um, in time. Um, <laughs> So like, like everybody else, I received a lot of emails. I stopped counting after 300. Um, I re being on the flip side, after spending many years sending a lot of emails, I made a commitment and I replied to every single one of those emails. What I said to the people are, is that I will take the comments and concerns into account. I'm especially grateful for the few original emails that shared personal stories um, that were sent. Um, as, as a parent and someone that was tasked to look at the, um, to take into account the, the well-being of all the students, um, I really appreciate the comments made by other committee members, especially the counselor from Ward 1, whose words really resonated, I think, the way a lot of parents feel. Um, but I just want to summarize what I feel want to, what, what I think I heard you say, and I, I just want to be confident in this, what I think I heard you say is that you are confident in your revised budget, you are comfortable with it, it does not represent a cut to services, and we are not uh, reducing any positions. Is that accurate? So I, I am confident that the school department um, can succeed next year with that budget number. Um, there are positions that are being reduced, but there are not um, necessarily people attached to those. So it's not that people are being, uh, you know, we're laying people off. There, um, and and that was part of the decision around using Esther to sort of put that mm -hmm. off for another year, so we can have time to look at those particular sections. Um, and there was a third part to your question that I may have missed. Um, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, you're comfortable with the revised budget. Yeah. Um, it doesn't represent a cut to services. Oh, the services piece. So so it would still, it still accommodates the emotional well-being and the challenges that we're facing in the second part of the COVID pandemic. Yes, I think it does. I mean, obviously, to Council Paz's point earlier, I mean, there are other positions that we had on there that we were hopeful for that would have helped us um, address some of those issues perhaps easier. Um, but the 5% that's in the, um, in the current mayor's uh, recommendation is in some ways sort of supplemented by the positions that we moved over to ESSER, right? So that, that sort of level funded idea being in the six, uh, low 6% 6 range using the grant to salvage these positions is helping us get closer to that number. So um, it does represent a smaller number than the 7.33 that we um, asked for, but um, we were able to use the grant to, I think, minimize is probably the best way for me to say it, any sort of reduction in services overall or programming. And as the leader of, of the school community, are you comfortable that um, you can build consensus with within the school commit uh, within the school community that we are fully capable of having a robust school year with this, and that we should be we can be positive and move forward with this budget. Yeah, I appreciate the question, Council Cates. That that's uh, I see that as one of my primary uh, jobs over the next couple of weeks, in particular, as we close school out, to get that message out to staff. Because I think the emails that you all received, that the school committee received, that I received, that the mayor received, 
um, you know, talked a lot about cuts to the budget. And, you know, I think obviously the message was sort of missed there that we have a number, yes, that on paper represents sort of this reduction, but that we shifted funding sources so that we were able to save positions uh, for the current year to give us the space to sort of do a really deep dive into um, those positions in particular. So to sort of correct that message out there, I see as a really important goal of mine. I've been hesitant to do a lot of that directly because the budget is still not approved. And so I, you know, I'm just careful with my messaging until we go through this process. I'm able to meet with the school committee tonight. Uh, the city council is able to look at where you are and that there's a decision made and that then uh, we can go forward. But I've been trying to do that as much as possible and, and we'll continue those efforts. I think the positive piece you're talking about is really critically important. It's been a hard year for schools everywhere and to try and close this year out next Tuesday with people feeling like taking a deep breath and, and looking forward to a couple of months uh, to reset and eager to come back knowing that they're not coming back to sort of fewer services or a deficit, um, that they will come back to um, you know a school department that resembles very much what they're in right now in terms of services and supports, which is a good place. So uh, I will make that a, a priority of mine to message that out to um, staff and to parents. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Katz. Before I give up the chair and ask a few questions myself, I would like to say that <clears throat> being an unprecedented time where we do not know if we are going to be presented with another budget. This, after today, we still have the mayor to present her budget. This meeting is not adjourned. It is only recessed until Tuesday the 21st at 6 okay. o'clock. And I've spoken to the auditor and the clerk, and I just want to say that if your budget changes or things are asked to change of you, I would hope that you would make yourselves available for that time, because mm -hmm. I believe we will have more questions. Um, at that time, again, being said, nothing's recessed. We, we can't ask of you to come back. Um, obviously, who knows? Yes. So I just want to make Absolutely. you aware of that so you're not being contacted on no, Tuesday um, saying. Uh, I will be here if need be. Absolutely. No question. Thank you. That being said, Council of Fossey. Mr. Chair, second time. I'd like to make the motion to have Council of Idal chair the remainder of the meeting if you are looking to step down. Council of Vidal, I ask that you take the chair. Are you okay to take the chair from there, or? It's up to you. All right. I'll, I'll stay here. Stuff. Okay. I'll, stay here, yeah. I'll start by saying, in terms of the dropout rate, there's been a lot of talk of it. Oh, all those in favor? Thank you. Thank you very much. Opposed? Council of Vidal, you have the chair. In terms of the dropout rate, um, I think some may be afraid to say it, and I, I don't think that number reflects the school. I don't think it's your fault. I think it's a system-wide, whether it be state or federal. That's the fault that a lot of these students, they start their schooling knowing the exact date they're stopping. It's a, it's a pathway to citizenship. It's a, it's a pathway to be here legally. And they have no intentions of finishing their schooling. And they have every intention of just not breaking the law. And I, I do sp speak to students of that. Demographic, I, I do know it, and, and I want to say I, I, I don't blame you for a lot of the dropouts. That being said, I do have concerns for the first grade through 12th grade of students that are leaving for a private school, right? Fiscal year 21 was the first full year of, of COVID learning, yep. and people fled, not to the fault of the school. Like, there was a lot of uncertainty, but when a small private school can sit there and say, hey, we don't have to answer to, to so many people, we're gonna be in school. People fled, our ladies was a waiting list, Arlington Catholic, to no fault of yours. We did think that trend would end as the schools went back to full-time learning as masks were lifted, but I'm not sure that trend is ending. I, I, if anything, I see that it's, it's still spiking, mm -hmm. and that concerns me. <clears throat> um, so with that being said, I will make a request um, that the school department provide a number of students who have left the Waltham Public School System for private education for grades 1 through 12 for fiscal year 21, 22, and if possible, um, any that have, are known to do it for the 
fiscal year 23. We have a sense of the motion for a request. Will you put that in writing? It is. All right. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the initial budget book that you handed us on page 8, um, and I know it's been talked about, so I just want to dive into the numbers a little bit. The, contract, the contractual increases of 2.74%, is that just the educators? Or is, is that the non-union administrators? Is that, is that everyone in that number, that 2.74% of contractual increases? So that, yeah, so, so that includes um, collective bargaining agreements. Mm -hmm. It includes a contractual increase for um, transportation costs. It includes um, a co an increased cost for the out-of-district special education tuitions, which those rates are mm -hmm. set by the state. Okay. So that's a contractual obligation. So those are the items within that category of contractual right. increases. Thank you. The <coughs> Waltham Education Association, what is their contractual cost of living increase do you, currently that they're working on, or that would have been used for this budget? So there's no, the, their contract expires at the end of August, so there's no um, cost of living adjustment factored into their salaries for, for next year. We do have a, a contingency for collective bargaining, um, but it hasn't been identified as to which Okay. contract it would be applied to or, or so, the allocation of those funds so the th the in, in the this has been talked about the 85% uh, of all the public schools operating budget of our salaries in it says it represents a th um, three to four percent expenditure increase annually there none of the teachers received any increase for that so the, there's no cost budget. of living adjustment in next year's contract but there are step and degree of course, changes that, was, that, that, was, that okay. will still hold in place for next year. So if it teaches eight years of experience this year, next year they go up to step nine, so that's an increase that we will, so that has been calculated. Some teachers will have increases because of their education and their, and yes. their longevity, but there are plenty of teachers that won't have an increase. If they've reached the maximum step and or, of course, you know, okay. yeah. And so with that being said, on page 93 of that same book, it starts the, the cost centers that have been talked about. Um, <clears throat> the administrative offices, is anyone in that union? Um, no, there wouldn't be anybody in the okay. Waltham Educators Association within that cap are cost Are the increases in their salaries, are those contra contractually obligated? Those, uh, yeah, those are, um, there are individual contracts. If, if an employee is not in a, uh, a collective bargaining union, Mm -hmm. They have an individual contract. Um, in most cases, the individual contracts have been settled um, through FY23. There are some that still um, are pending uh, some, so just asking, some increase. Um, if we're saying that, that there's nothing been increased on the teacher side, you know, we're looking at 9% uh, increase, 5% increase, 17% increase, 9%, 4, 4, 4 and a half. These are all contractually so those, obligated? So those numbers are misleading. Um, if the the FY22 budget is um, the the actual budgeted amount when the FY22 budget was approved, that may not have included a cost of living adjustment for that contractual year. It may have happened after the budget was developed. So going from the FY22 budget to the FY23 budget is skewed because FY22 budget doesn't reflect the adjusted salary. Okay. Um, using the email that we received yesterday through, I believe, Dr. Regan through the auditor, which gave the salaries um, of all the Waltham public school yep. employees. Using those numbers going and then to the 23 budget, is yes. that more of an that would accurate? Be, that would be more accurate, more yes. Accurate? yes. Um, taking a few of the administrative numbers, I believe, we're looking over from, for a, a two-year increase, uh, I believe someone had a 19% increase over two years, and then 6.7% and 7.2% increase. The, are these, are, are the administrative offices contractually, are, are they getting these raises of this percentage over, over years? Or am I doing horrible math? 
Um, I, I would want to take a look. Those numbers seem quite high, so I would want to take a look at exactly and, and I'm, where I'm it is. I'm roundabout trying to say, and, and I know you hear this, I, I, that the administrative offices are top heavy. The salaries are exorbitant, and I'm, I'm trying to to break that down. I'm trying to see where the disconnect is. If it's true, you know, you, you hear we, like every other counselor has sat through it, you talk to administrators, you talk to teachers, you talk to students. I have kids who that are, have begun this school system. I truly, truly care about this city. I love the city of Waltham and I want to see succeed in the best way across all avenues. So I've, I've, kept, I've kept people at my place of work for hours with their spouses calling saying, where are you? Because I'm trying to, to do my job and figure out where we are with this budget because again, as the, the dean, the president said, this is our one time that we really interact with the school department. Mm -hmm. But at, the, at that being said, when we're out at soccer practices, at, at hockey practice, we're talked to by the community as we would be a, a school community member. Hey, this is wrong in the school system. It's like, hey, it's separation of church and state. We try to say that. Like, we, we, there's nothing for us. We, we can't. We have nothing to do, but this is our time. So I, I'm trying to take in everything, and I was really trying to find that disconnect with those numbers. I'll, I'll take a look through those and um, see The, and, and just the administrative costs, and again, I just said it. Where does the administrative costs sit um, for similar communities of our size? You mean the salaries for? Yes, please. Um, I, I, it varies from position to position, but I mean, it, in, in even like within our principal core, where there are 10 principals, we have some that are within an average range, and we have some that fall slightly below. Um, but I, I would think that looking at the administrative pay structure here, where we strive to sort of shoot for, you know, what the what the going rate is, right? So we'll look around. So if we're hiring a principal and it's an elementary school, you know, we know that that principal that that average might be about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. We're just throwing numbers out there, right? So we, tr you know, that's the focus when we bring somebody in and hire them, and we go with the the going rate. Is <laughs> uh, forgive me, I, and I to be more specific, I'm more looking at the administrative offices to not just you know the trickle down the, to the, the principals and the, and the, the ed educational administrators, if you will. I'm not really looking for those numbers, more the administrative offices. Maybe I'm not understanding which. This is very oh. This is oh, okay, so central, yeah, all right, yeah, central office. Yeah, same idea. So if I'm hiring an assistant superintendent, or if you're hiring a superintendent, you're, you're looking at sort of what the, what the fair market value is uh, in like size communities uh, for those positions. Sometimes we, depending on experience, we may be able to come in lower than that. Um, if it's a candidate that is really strong, that has a lot of experience, again, we try and shoot somewhere in the middle um, so that there's room to grow. Uh, but each of those contracts is individualized and, and, you know, negotiated. However, when we do post it, we typically will post it with a, with a range so that we know uh, where we are, and if we can't meet that person in that range, then the hire doesn't happen. Okay. Um, and there are experiences not just in these areas, but other areas where a candidate just it doesn't work out because we can't meet their uh, their salary demands. But that happens everywhere. Um, so um, last year, you inherited a uh, a new position that I questioned. Um, and I had questioned before, you were the superintendent. It was in the budget. It was taken out because of COVID. Um, the new HR director, I don't I, Yeah, administrator the, of the human resources. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How has, has that gone? Has, has the, there obviously a big goal of that position was to, to attain, hire, attain um, a, a diverse workforce. How has that gone? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that department has, um, you know, one of the members has, uh, has gone on to another district since then to find a, to become a director herself. Um, so it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a year where there's been some turnover, so we haven't sort of fully realized we were hoping for 3.0 people to be in human resources, 
and we haven't experienced that this year yet. Um, what it did give us the opportunity to do as a budget savings for next year is to consider sort of a reorg of the department. I mean, same number of people, but um, uh, you know, sort of going for human resource generalists, you know, to work uh, at a lesser salary uh, going forward starting next year. Um, so, you know, we have gone through that process of hiring and in and, and, and starting July 1, we should have a full complement of people in that department. Um, one of the things that the new director did when she came in is we did obtain a grant around um, diverse hiring and, um, you know, there's been a real sort of shift focus towards recruitment, um, which I never thought I'd say this in public schools, but like that's what you need to do now. You need to go out, beat the bushes, try and find candidates from, it doesn't matter what the position is. Um, we're, we're fighting for, for good candidates all the time and, and how do we attract them to Waltham? So uh, we've sort of shifted our focus to that, to, to you know, not just to push, put the job out and hope people apply, uh, but to use hiring fairs and recruitment fairs and other tactics to try and attract people in to deepen that pool. Thank you. I want to ask one more question for that, but I'm going to hold it for now. Okay. <clears throat> you had made a comment. I'm, I'm bouncing around, so please, please uh, bear with me. Um, how the pandemic is driving enrollment. Um, and I, I may have touched upon it before, but you made it a quick comment on it in your brief presentation with, with this packet. Mm -hmm. um, could you just speak to it a little more, like what you mean by, by that? So it goes back, it was in a couple of things. So number one, you mentioned earlier about how um, we had a lot of families that went to private or even to homeschool option when the pandemic hit. That was not a phenomenon unique to Waltham. That happened as the state saw its public school numbers go down dramatically. Um, so that's a contributing factor that's related to the pandemic that is that pushed enrollment down. We haven't seen all of those kids come back yet. Um, uh, and the other thing is, um, you know, um, the openness or, or not openness of the border and, and bringing in uh, families that are new to the country too. Um, so that there wasn't a lot of mobility there for the last couple of years either. Um, and that's an enrollment driver in, in Waltham that we, we watch closely and make sure that we have um, you know, staffing and supports in place to support those families as well. So those, those are sort of two of the bigger drivers right now that I, I think we're watching very closely. And again, one of the reasons why you know, these, these elementary sections that, for example, that this, the, the five sections plus the fine and performing arts that go with them, Yes, those averages are low, 14, 15 kids in a class. Um, but I was, I'm cautious about just pulling those out of the FY23 budget without seeing if there's some kind of rebound that could come in the fall where we see more of the private and homeschool kids coming back and we see um, you know, more families coming into Waltham, um, particularly from outside of, the, of uh, the United States. So we want to watch those numbers carefully and not sort of give away those um, those sections until we're really confident that the trend we're seeing now is true and it's going to hold. Um, and I think the pandemic is what's causing that us to sort of not feel as confident about enrollment projections right now. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. The this and this has been talked about um, quite a bit for the last few hours. The twenty-one thousand five seventy-one cost per student. Uh, where does that sit um, for like like-size school systems? Are we, is that right in the middle? Are we high? Are we no, low? I don't think we, I, I mean, I, I, I'm just speculating based on sort of when I visit the department site and the Department of Ed site and I look, I think you would, you would find Waltham to be um, not in the middle, but above the middle, maybe the top third. Um, you know, particularly when you're comparing to like districts, you know, we, um, we fare very well. I mean, the, the, the community funds the schools well, there's no question there. And, uh, um, you know, part of part of the concern I had when these emails were coming out is like that's being missed by sort of the general public. That uh, it's and I'm, I'm glad you say that uh, because I, I know the council from mode one had made made note of it. Um, we we care about our school system. And I, I think we have funded oh, it well, and I think the the mayor has a proven track record of, mm -hmm. of taking deep care for that school system and the children in it. Right. 
And uh, to, I know Councillor from Ward 7 had made mention to this, a lot of the emails and a lot of the personalized emails, and, and a few of those uh, made mention to, you know, morale being low in the school system as it is, and this cut or not fully funding would, would even deepen that low morale. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think this is, I think this is something you inherited because I don't think you've been here two years. You, the, the morale can't just automatically turn, uh, take a 180 degree turn. But what has caused, what has, do you think has caused that morale to be at that point where they're sending the email saying morale is already at an all time low? So I, I've been an educator a long time. I'm married to one as well who works in an elementary school in another district. So schools are generally happy places, right? There, you, you see children, you engage with them, you, it's, it's all about people, you're with people all day. And I think when COVID came, it really changed that dynamic for a lot of people and it hurt folks and they haven't really recovered. And so last year was hard, but this year was worse because we came back in September thinking it's going to be back to normal. Um, maybe we're wearing masks, but we'll be okay. Everything's back. And then it was just this roller coaster ride that I think emotionally, in general, people were not ready for. We had teachers come back after not you know last school year that didn't come back well at all. Um, some of whom left the profession and that's not because of their school but it was just how damaged they were by this traumatic experience um, and so I, I think that has had a, a huge impact on sort of the overall feeling of, of, of staff in schools and I also think it varies from school to school uh, there's a lot of conversation today about the high school I will say to the council that this is not lost on me and, and uh, my office is in that building so I see what's happening there on a daily basis and, um, you know, I think if you were to pull that school out separately, you, you might have more staff there feeling uh, in, a, in a low place than you do at maybe one of our elementaries right now. It varies from school to school. Um, but there's no question that people are still hurting from this pandemic and, and schools have not emotionally recovered from it um, all that well. And I think, um, I think about convocation last year, and we weren't all in the auditorium like we usually are because we were still being cautious, but I did have the high school staff in front of me and everyone else was watching live, and there was this sense of, yeah, we're back, we're together. Teachers were excited to see each other, like the feeling was good, and it, it, it took about a month before we realized, oh, here comes the, the fall peak, and then people were getting sick, and they were getting worried again, and, and we know what happened after the holidays, and, and testing, and you know, with the swabs, and all. It, it just, People weren't ready for that roller coaster, and I, I don't think uh, many folks weathered it very well. Um, and you know, I mean, we're all included in that. I mean, it's just it was a very, very challenging year. Um, and we talk about social emotional uh, supports for students. We try and remind ourselves as staff we need to take care of ourselves as well, and that's not always the case because these adults are focusing more on the kids in front of them than their own well-being. So. Um, all I can say is that we leave this year with the hope that we have a, a, a healthy summer and people can come back. We, you know, and there's no mask mandate put back in place, and schools start, uh, you know, back to where they're normal. I was at MacArthur today for a concert. I know I'm off topic, but just to see the gym filled with parents again, to watch their kids perform in a music concert for the first time in two years, that's a pretty impactful thing to think about that these they haven't the, the winter concert was virtual they couldn't go in and see them play so that that's having a, a really significant impact on on everybody and and that idea of schools being a happy place where you go um, the pandemic really has had a, a significant impact on that I do not disagree at all uh, you actually made a comment that kind of segued into my next <coughs> line of questioning, which was the social emotional learning. Um, and, you know, speaking with some Waltham public schools uh, employees, you know, it's almost felt as that that it, it I don't know if because of COVID, but it, that has become almost a crutch to mm. to a zero consequence policy. And, and, and I'm going to segue into the, you know, the public safety part of, of some of my concerns and it's not just the high school I, I believe the, the middle schools one middle school in particular having hearing 
a lot of issues and, um, and I believe the council from one one and kind of made reference to it and it, I've, I've grappled with repeating it and, and asking for more detail but you know there's, there's some serious conversations about sexual assaults taking place not just at the high school but at the middle schools are, are you, do you have numbers on, on these on these allegations yeah there was there was one incident at the high school and there's another one that is an allegation at the middle school and we I can't say much here I'm, but the, I'm not asking for detail I, um, we do not. involve the police when this happens and um, I think because of sort of what you've just been describing around sort of the general feeling in schools whenever something occurs bad behavior it sort of takes on a life of its own outside of the walls of the school as well and we're in a position where I can't say well actually here's what happened here's what the student did and here's what the consequences were um, to your point around SEL being used as a crutch like the, the, yes I mean pandemic aside we are trying to focus at the younger grades in particular more of sort of a restorative practices approach where you know kids sort of learn from their behaviors I mean we don't want to be suspending elementary school age kids we'd rather them to sort of learn from their behaviors and right if we have to we have to right but we try not to um, the middle and the high school um, there have been more suspensions in both of those at both of those levels this year than we've experienced in a typical year that doesn't sort of play out in the public we're not talking about that but that that is a reality there are consequences being handed out and um, I think what's happening again I think particularly at the high school the day-to-day -day behaviors kids sort of slipping out of the building or kids you know cutting class those behaviors are what they're having trouble keeping up with because there are more serious behaviors that they're investigating and, and, and providing consequences for. Um, so I, I think that that the restorative justice approach is not really taking hold necessarily at the high school. Uh, there is a feeling that there's not enough being done. I get that. Um, but I can tell you those associate principals are applying discipline in, in a heavy way. Um, to a lot of students up there to the point we don't we don't like that but it's it is happening and I um, I don't doubt it and I know yeah. it's not curbing the behavior the way we want it to I, I think there's an attitude especially in that building where it doesn't matter what you do that it's not going to change and these people are these these students have an end date in mind and it's not graduation hmm. and, and I think that that truly affects the rest of the school mm -hmm. and I think it's taking a much deeper impact than we're willing to admit or talk about and I understand it's it's an unpopular opinion it, it's 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 nervous to talk about but I think it, it needs to it needs to be talked about because I do agree that you're gonna you're gonna lose some of the good ones the teachers the students um, if if more isn't done um, So just before I finish this, I, I, I want to go back to what we had kind of gotten lost on the administrative contracts. And I th think we, you had helped Dr. Reed find it. We're talking about the administrative offices in, 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 in the cost center. Those contracts are, the, 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 the increases the steps, those are contractually obligated. And these contracts are individually negotiated as they're not union employees so they're obviously negotiating their own contracts yes they, they have yes they have standard typical standard three-year contract With individual contract cost of living increases that are yes seem to be higher than the what the education the what the union may have which this is fine that's a an agreed upon bargaining but yeah I think we we want to look through these because you raised some numbers that were I can tell you I'm not giving out 19% percent uh, in it's, there so I, I, get that. Um, I don't mind I don't mind telling you uh, I can use myself as an example because yeah. why not um, what's reflected in the book from FY 22 to FY 23 is is showing two years worth of uh, Cola for me okay. right so and it's public so when I signed my contract it was three years with a two percent Cola yeah. each year so what you see in the book shows my starting and so what I earned in year one and then in FY 23 it shows you what I will be earning next year so what I'm earning this year is not in the book 
So, and I actually raised this with Leanne when the book came out because I said this is not helping. It's not people helping see, at and all. it looks like the superintendent is getting a four percent raise. It looks like a lot of people are not, getting a four percent so raise. The contract, yes. So a lot of people are in that same boat where the FY22 book came out, and then there isn't like we had talked about. There may need to be another column in this that says FY22 adjusted, so you can see that because in some cases that 2% COLA wasn't negotiated at the time when we did this book. And that happens, of Then course. it gets negotiated after the fact that this book doesn't get updated, so then it looks like there's been um, more than a typical cost of living raise. So I just use myself as an example since I'm standing here and I'm not. And yeah. I, I, I'd be very mad at myself because I'm bouncing back to another question and more across the uh, lines of, of student safety. Um, how many f fires have been started in the middle schools? Fires. fires. And how many have reported, been reported? So I, and, and forgive me if I'm saying this wrong, the one I know, I know of two incidents that were connected mm -hmm. um, at McDevitt that the fire department was involved in. It was the same student. Now, I, um, and I, Oh, please, I'll let you finish. I don't want me yeah. to interrupt. I apologize. Um, and if there is another that I'm not remembering while I'm standing here, then I'd, I'd have to go back and check. It's been a long no, year. But I, <laughs> that, that may be the, the same incidents that I, I may be referring to, but in, and I, maybe I do hope I'm wrong here, that the fire department wasn't really um, even notified in, in, until much later. And, and, and it is my understanding that it is a, a state fire code that mm -hmm. the minute even this piece of paper gets lit on fire that the state fire marshal needs to be notified of a school yep. uh, of fire in a school and I, yes, I, it's my understanding that that proper procedure was not followed and in my I just no, let me finish sorry, sorry, yep. my concerns are that you know as these things go on un, un, unchecked that you know our administrative our education administrators are maybe going unchecked too I think the consequences for them should be should be more harsh than the students. If you say, you know, we're not looking to bring in full restorative justice, I think adults who are charged with protecting our children along with educating our children, I'm okay with restorative justice being applied to them. And I, I would, you know, if jobs are lost, jo in, in terms of that, jobs are lost. And I think I would be okay with that for the safety of our children. Mm -hmm. So I am, I, I know I just spewed a lot. If you want to speak to that, you can. I am. Done. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much. Do you have anybody else on your list? We are good. Uh, no, at this time there is no one else. All right. All right. So, Dr. Regan, I think we are all set. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. We have a word. Uh, no, I have to. The May is coming up. Yeah, the school is also the May. Let me make you feel. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.